recording. Um, so welcome to uh, our viewers. Welcome to a, a one shot panel brought to you by the Students of Shield, the comic book club affiliated with Penn State University. Um, I am your moderator, Mikey, and joining us today is two legends that I'm surprised we even got here in the first place because it's just it's just their their career and everything about them is so recognizable and just legendary to be honest uh one is a writer and editor one is a writer and artist the dynamic duo themselves louise and walt simonson how are you guys doing today hi we've been great we've how been good. Been? we're we're good so right guys we're, we're good <laughs> yeah we're dealing with the whole pandemic and classes so it is tricky situation but we're going through it very well so has the campus been doing pretty well as far yeah. as COVID is concerned, generally? Yeah, so far so good. I mean, we're mostly a mix of online and in person, mostly online. Now, right. we just, uh, most of the time, we're either in our apartments or in our dorms, just doing our classes, or we're in, in of some buildings, not all of them, but that's the situation with us going right. on. So my first, I just want to do like a quick icebreaker question. Um, so how have you guys been dealing with uh, the pandemic? Have you been like catching up with? TV shows, I've been writing new material, working on new stuff. Like, how have you guys been doing on for? Oh, I go out and knock off convenience stores once in a while, just nice. kind of relieve the tension. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I mean, the weird thing is, since we're freelancers, mm -hmm. uh, our lives haven't changed in a lot of ways. I mean, the way years as students have changed, I would think enormously. Um, not having cl direct classes, kind of not being able to hang out with all your friends in quite the same way. Although I do see pictures of, footage of college campuses with giant frat parties going on occasionally with lots of people without masks on them. I'm sure nobody here in this room is like that. No, we we, we take this very seriously. Good. Uh, it is very serious. Probably more for me than for you guys, but yeah, of course. nevertheless. Um, but we, you know, we work at home anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. We're used to being in the same house all the time. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh-oh. Um, so basically, um, we've, you know, we keep working. I mean, I will say one of the things about maybe just because of the COVID, uh, maybe it's the tension. I'm not quite sure what it is. I seem to be working a lot slower than mm. I did. I mean, I could, I'd, I'd like to play the old guy card here and say, oh, it's my age. But really, uh, I think it's probably as much to do with just, you know, there aren't as many deadlines. The company's closed down for two or three months. Um, now they're kind of opened back up, at least to some extent. Um, I know some people have lost their jobs in comics, and I don't think those are coming back. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't know what the comic shop situation is going to be when this is all done. Yeah. Uh, most of the shops don't operate, as far as I can tell, on a large extra budget. So when you've got a shoestring budget and no customers, it's very difficult. Our local shop here, has, where we live, uh, uh, north of New York City, has opened up again. But it's, uh, I forget what the phrase is now, but it's like restaurants. It's like touch and go. You call them up, they bring your comics out, you pick them up on the yeah. sidewalk and get going. Mm -hmm. um, so that is happening and, and the local comic shop is uh, functioning in that way. But, um, uh, you know, how the industry is going to be once this is, the dust really settles, hard to say. Yeah. So you guys are in New York, New York City? North of New York, north of New, New York. York? Okay, got it. Yeah, we were in New York for a number of years and then mm -hmm. blew it off for the country, sort of, okay. sort of the country. Hey, sugar, I was gonna say if you could up your light just a little bit. Just you're... turned on the overhead light. <laughs> oh as, well, as bright as it gets. Unless you want to do this, let me see what I can do. Do that. Well, I mean, maybe, that maybe it, was, it was fun before. <laughs> you didn't have to. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> never mind. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was fun I, before. I'm, I'm married to a vampire, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> I don't know. It's not that bad. I think no, actually, it's not bad. See me, right? Well. Yep. Yeah. No, we can we can see you fine. We can find we can see you fine, Louise. It's no it's no okay, problem. I'll turn on the other light. I have to say. <laughs> but Louise, how have you been doing uh, with the pandemic and quarantine? I, I've been comes doing to work? fine. Um, I've been maybe working more slowly. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, I I think I call it. I sort of like call it COVID brain. Okay. Where they're so. Um, I don't know. It's a little discombobulating, I guess, as you all know. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you, you can't go out and have meet your friends at restaurants. And I mean, we, we, as Walter said, we do work at home and we've been working at home, you know, since the dawn of time. But it's, 
unrelentingly at home. Okay. I mean, it's like, oh boy, I get to go to the grocery store and buy <laughs> groceries. Yay, out with people. I mean, we do walk the dog every day. Nice, that's um, good. And um, I, you know, finished up the deadlines that I had, but then I got a whole batch of new ones. So um, I've, you know, I've got work. I'm just less, less gung ho to jump in and do yeah, it. Exactly. And the like, workflow is a little bit slower. Okay. Yeah, well, and when I'm, you, when, I mean, when we, we have had friends over for you know outside socially distanced dinners, but then after that, I always like to wait about you know ten or twelve days between engagements so that if anybody's going to get COVID, we'll know, and then we 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 won't pass it on to other people. So okay, that's good. Uh, I mean, that's that's our that's our lives. It sounds very dull. I know you guys have much more interesting lives. Ah. But we're but we're very dull people, so it's okay. It worked out fine. Well, well, I'm glad you guys are doing. At least you're getting your workflow done. I mean, it, I, as it slowed down, of course, but I mean, as long as you guys are, you know, keeping yourself safe and comfortable, that's all that matters. So, well, one one thing I did do is I took on some commission work. One nice. thing, and I've still got three or four of those left to do. I, I never do commissions. I, I virtually never. I will do drawings for charity auctions, things of that sort. But most of the time, I really prefer telling stories and drawing to tell stories mm -hmm. rather than doing a great big shot of you know, whoever it might be. I did want a block recently from the Legion of Superheroes, nice. which was kind of fun. I drew block. I drew block. I've drawn him once or twice. Um, so I, you know, I did a. I've done a Darth Vader. I've done a couple of Thors. I've done a Beta Ray Bill. I mean, some of the ones you'd expect, and then some of them like block that you you wouldn't really expect. I have one coming up. I have to draw Bizarro, which is mm -hmm. kind nice. of interesting. I don't think I've drawn Bizarro professionally up to now um, at all. Um, I've got a big Thor commission I have to do and some other stuff like that. So I do have things to do. And honestly, if I'd sat down and got worked at it the way I used to work back in April, these would all be done in memories back a long time ago by now. But I still have several. I nap more than I used to. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I get up and go, oh, I'm tired. I think I'll just lie down for a while. So I don't know if that's part of the COVID stuff or not, but but we are getting work done. I'm I'm working. I've been doing a comic called Ragnarok for a while now. Yeah. Slowly, I was doing that slowly before the pandemic, and I am plotting out the fourth arc right now. So mm -hmm. I've done uh, a lot of work on that. I came up with an ending yesterday that I was pretty pleased about. I I have nice. to do some work. I got to polish it some, but I'm I'm getting that nailed. So I'll have that ready to go. A few more in a couple of weeks, I hope I'll have that all squared away. Nice, nice, good, good. Um, so my second question for you both, because uh, of course you guys have worked on a majority of everything you can work on in comics when it comes to characters for like the big two, like um, Louise has done what New Mutants, like she created Power Pack, did Cable, all the other cool stuff. Walt did Thor, Fantastic Four, some Batman. Um, so I want to know out of all the stuff you guys have done, which it, which has been your either like your favorite character or title to work on throughout your career. One of, one of you can go. Please. Okay, my favorite is whatever I'm working on right now. Got it. <laughs> that's the most fun I'm having right now. Right. Um, probably the one that's maybe the most meaningful for me is Power Pack, because mm. I meet June and I made it up. So it's you know that that makes a difference also it was the first comic I wrote so I think that that one it was actually kind of I guess my favorite in a way mm -hmm. um I I'm working on a power pack mini series now that'll be out you know this coming summer supposedly nice. if anything comes out in the summer <laughs> we'll see. Oh, yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> um you know if the check clears it's my favorite comic book of course <laughs> um really uh probably and I've done several. I've done several titles that I've been very happy to do and happy with the work. My sentimental favorite probably remains a strip called Manhunter that I wrote and drew in. Oh, I didn't write it. I'm sorry. I drew in 1973 and 74. Um, I it was uh, for DC. It was a backup feature in Detective Comics. It was a bi-monthly book, so it ran for a year. It ran. There were seven chapters. Ar the late Archie Goodwin, who was the editor of the yes. book was really the creator of the character. I was the designer of the character and we worked together. I began that work six months into my career, which means I was 20, 
uh, 26 probably when I started drawing that strip. It ran for a year. We had a definitive climax that wrapped up the story. Archie was leaving the company to go work elsewhere. And the new editor on the book, Julie Schwartz, was not going to run the strip. And honestly, I wasn't going to do it without Archie, even if the option had been there, which it wasn't. So we decided that we would close everything down with a, uh, we had been planning on doing a Batman crossover. So we just made the Batman story part of the mm -hmm. Manhunter story and did a 20 page climax to the whole thing. And before I began that strip, I was six months into my career. I was a guy that, you know, I knew my contemporaries in comics by then, Howard Shaken. The day I came to New York, I met looking for work, Howard Shaken, Bernie Wrights and Michael Kaluta, mm -hmm. and probably Dan Green were all sitting around the table at DC in the coffee room. So I knew all the young guys. I met all the young guys in the six months, those six months. But a lot of the editors didn't know who I was. And when I finished that strip about a year later, a little over a year later, uh, it had done really well professionally. There wasn't the kind of fandom that we would have now that what we're doing right now would never have happened. If you had, you had, you'd have had trouble scraping together nine people to talk about comics, but the strip had won several awards. And so when I finished that strip, every editor knew who I was. And I really never had to go out looking for work again. I was offered jobs after that uh, in a way I had not been before. So, and I still have plenty of fans who think the work I did when I was 26 was the best work I ever did. So, nice. uh, so it's, it's nice. It's, you know, it's a sentimental favorite and in some ways i worked with archie more closely than i worked with anybody else i've worked with any other writers i i can't tell you why it's a little like lightning in a bottle but there was something about our working together that both of us thoroughly enjoyed and i think that's you see that in the work and also i see and you can go back and look at the material uh in fact it's uh, here's a quick plug it's being reprinted by dc I think in hardcover or sometime next year. Hasn't it's been out, but not hasn't been out for a number of decades or so. And uh, when I did that work, I can see in the beginning chapter the development of me as an artist, as a draftsman, over the course of those seven chapters. The last chapter is much better drawn than the first chapter. And so for those reasons, that's a sentimental favorite for me. Got it. All right. Um sorry, I have to step out for a bit. Rebecca, could you ask the next question, please? Uh, which one? Third one. Anyone you want. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone you want, we're good. Uh, you just asked the third one, so I guess I'll go back to the second one. Then. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Uh, so how did you guys get into comics, and uh, what were your biggest influences on your writing or art? Okay, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll try and keep it shorter than usual. Um, oh, I don't know. The, my, my influences are, I mean, the, the, the bottom ones are all the ones you'd expect. Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, yeah, maybe Gene Colan. They were guys whose work I love but weren't, wasn't really influenced by. But the fact they were doing work was the stuff I was reading. I read comics as a kid in the 50s. I read every kind of comic that, was, that I could afford to buy, which means I read comics about, that were Westerns. I read comics that were TV adaptations movie adaptations. Um, the first one of the early ones I read was Helen of Troy, which was an, uh, an adaptation of a movie directed by Robert Wise in the mid fifties. Uh, it was a British Italian co-production, I think. And I read the comic beautifully drawn, most likely by John Buscema, almost certainly not inked by John. It's possible his brother inked it. It was gorgeous. I loved it. I still love it. However, at the end of it, Helen and Paris get away. I don't know if you've read the Iliad, but or the stuff after the Aeneid that ends it, but Helen and Paris do not get away. That is a different ending from, from Homer and from Virgil. And movie, I, went, I, think, yes. I went to see the movie, and the movie, they don't get away either. Paris dies. Oh, spoiler alert. Paris dies and and Helen goes back to Greece. And I was I was flabbergasted. I have never gotten over the fact that Paris and Helen didn't get away together in a romantic getaway somewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I read comics. I loved them. Uh, I read comics in college in the 60s when Marvel was doing great work, when Jack was doing some of his most brilliant work. 
Ditko, uh, Gil Kane, um, Gene Cole, and all those guys. And so I eventually went to art school. I, when I was in art school, I developed a real interest in doing comics, physically writing my own stories. I wasn't interested in the writing, but I wrote my own story so I could draw it. Ultimately, that became my portfolio for going to New York. I just decided to go to New York and try and get into comics. Um, I'm sure my parents were thrilled. So I went to New York. Uh, the day I showed up at DC, this, you couldn't do this now. I was able to go into DC, I had an appointment, but I went into DC, I showed him to an editor. He said, well, this is nice, but what else can you do? And I thought, oh no, I'll never get into comics. I'll be working at McDonald's for the rest of my life. And I walked down to the coffee room. That's when I said, Howard Shaken, Bernie Wrights, and Michael Kaluta, probably Dan Green were all sitting around the little table in the coffee room. We ended up talking. I'd met Howard briefly about a year earlier, showed him my stuff. Uh, Michael Kaluta uh, took my portfolio. He showed it to this old guy behind me. And by old, I mean the guy about half my age now. But he seemed old to me then. His name was Jack Adler. He was the second in command in production at DC. I learned only after Jack was gone, he colored the very first Superman comic. He knew color and he did color. He was, he looked overlorded that stuff at DC as well as other things. And Michael showed him my work. He liked it. He said, let me go show this to Carmine. Carmine Infantino was the editor in chief publisher at DC at the time. I knew Carmine's work. He'd been an artist, a working artist for many years. And they took the, Jack took the portfolio and I sat there ner talking nervously to Bernie and Howard and Michael and Dan. And then Jack came back into the room at the dead run and he said, Carmen wants to see it, let's go. Like it was one sentence or one word. So I found myself in Carmine's office. Uh, we talked about comics. I don't remember anything about that conversation. Maybe five minutes, maybe 10. The only thing I remember is he did ask me if I liked Bernie Krigstein's work and was influenced by it. And at that time, I did not know Krigstein's work. If you guys don't know Krigstein's work, you should go seek it out. In particular, a story called Master Race, which was a story for EC Comics, which is an absolutely spectacular piece of storytelling. He had some other ones as well. But after we were done, Carmen liked my work. He called in three of his editors, including one of the ones who had turned me out of his office or sent me away gently, but sent me away saying, yeah, what else can you do? And he made them all give me a short story. Back then there were short stories in comics. So I drew two of the three stories. And by the time I had done that, one of the editors had begun to feed me small, this is, we're talking about three page stories, a couple of pinups, a five page story, really short little things used to be in the back of comics. And uh, I was able to hang on and make a living fairly at that stuff until I was offered Manhunter, which is my first regular gig. And then after that, I didn't really have to look back. Sorry, honey, that was as short as I could make it. That was short. I know, that was as short as I could make it. You did good. Oh, so I'm supposed to, I'm supposed That's to. That's you. I'm yeah, yeah. you okay. um, sorry. That's I, fine. I age, what can I say? Um, okay, what, I read books when I was a child. I didn't read mm -hmm. comics all that much. I got a tiny little allowance. You know, five cents got raised to 10 cents. And eventually when I was in high school, I was getting 25 cents a week for allowance. This, this is a long time ago, but it's, that really wasn't very much. Um, so, but my mother would take us to the library every week and we would take out, you know, as many books as they would let us take. I, mean, I have three sisters so we would all take out these giant stacks of books. So um, my comic book reading was done at the the Walgreens, I think, or whatever. I think it was like a Walgreens anyway. It was a drugstore that had spinner racks. And you know, you'd pull comics off the spinner rack and you'd read them and put them back. And they're, I, I mostly read things like the, the, soup, the cowboy comics mm -hmm. and um, Spike and, what was it? Oh dear. S what was Spike spit? Oh, uh, See, my brain is gone. My brain's we, gone too. Cute little kid comics. Yeah, and um, hmm? Sugar and Spike. Sugar and Spike. Sugar and Spike. And then um, uh, things like Turok, Son of Stone, and, uh, you know, Boy Adventure comics, really. And the occasional Superman, except Lois Lane aggravated me so much because she spent so much idiotic, she was, she was a reporter, and she spent all this time trying to make, figure out if Clark was Superman, and figuring weird ways to prove that 
he was, um, you know, trying to cut his hair and doing all sorts of stupid stuff. And I, got, I found her extremely annoying. So, um, but that was, that was my comic book reading, which, oh, oh, and we did have a subscription to Duck Comics. I think my grandmother had gotten it for us. So we read, um, it was to uh, Uncle Scrooge, the Disney comics, because those, mm. those were safe comics the children should be allowed to read. So um, I, and then, uh, so, but I never, it never occurred to me actually to, to have anything to do with comics for a living. I mean, I almost didn't quite comprehend that there were people actually creating these things. I mean, I just never thought about it. Um, so I was, I was living in New York, I was working, for a magazine publisher, I had friends who did comics, um, including Archie Goodwin that Walter did uh, did Manhunter with, and mm -hmm. his wife. And um, there was I had a friend who worked for Warren Publishing, was a small black and white publisher, did horror comics. Mm -hmm. And my friend said, "So there's a job opening at our company, and it pays better than the job at your company. Why don't you try?" And I said, okay. So I went in and I applied for the job and I got it. It was doing paste ups and mechanicals it was in production, which I was barely adequate at, but it was a very small company. And it, it they, they kept needing people to do things. They would need people to um, write letters pages and write advertising copy and do this and write this and write that. Uh, and I would say, I can do that. I could do that, I could do that. I kept claiming I could do things right, whether I'd ever done, done them not or before or not. And um, it turned out I could. So it turned out I was much better at the editorial stuff than I was at production. Nice. So in about, oh, probably a couple of months, they created an assistant editor position for me and moved me over into editing and um, pulled me out of editor, out of uh, production. I'm sure the production people were saying, oh yes, thank God she's gone. So, um, <laughs> I work as an assistant editor for a couple of years, I think. Walter will know how long I did. I never know how long I did anything. Mm -hmm. um, worked for a couple of years in production. I mean, in, in, in the, as an assistant editor. And then um, the editor left the line and, and my, our boss, Jim Warren, started looking around for uh, someone to take over as the editor of the line. And I went into him and I said, I wanna do that. And he said, Girls can't edit horror comics. Ooh, Ooh bet him. And I said, <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. I will edit the line for six months on my assistant's pay with no assistant, and I'll get everything on schedule, and then I've got the job. And he's not stupid, right? Think of all the money. He's, he's saving tons of money. So he said, <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, and so I did, and I got the job, and I was then the editor of that line which I was for the next several years. I can't remember. Walter. Four years. Four years. My goodness, that was a long time. Um, six to 379. <laughs> and um, so then I went over, uh, I, I, Jim, Jim, I, I, okay, I started to notice that the, uh, the publisher was less interested in, in doing comics and more interested in doing, I think, real estate or something else he was into. And, and the comics were kind of going by the wayside. And I got an offer from um, uh, uh, Jim Shooter to go over and work at Marvel. Mm -hmm. And so I went over there and I had a, I, I just had a dinner with him. And I said, well, you know, I'll think about it. Well, blah, 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 blah. And I came back. It was, I guess it was a lunch. And I came back into the office and got called into Shooter's office. I mean, into, uh, sorry, uh, Jim Warren's office, my boss's office. And he was furious because I had... He had heard, he must have had spies. He had heard that I was out to lunch with Jim Shooter and I was going over to work for Marvel and leaving, War leaving Warren. So he was real, real huffy and he said, just get out of your office. This is it, you're, you're, you're done. So <laughs> I went and uh, I tootled over to, um, we, we, later, we, we later made up and were friends again. But he, I think his feelings were hurt actually. Which is, you know, it's it's too bad he had spies because I would have broken it to him much more gently. Anyway, so I went over to Marvel and I worked there editing a batch of stuff for a few years, I guess. And then I they hired a batch of new editors, and my workload was cut in half. And I was I got bored, and Shooter had been after us to work on the other side of the desk. They, he wanted the editors to freelance, and I I could color. 
but there were people who were making a living coloring and I didn't want to take their mm -hmm. jobs. And mm -hmm. I, could, I couldn't draw, so that, that was completely out. And I didn't want to take work away from any of the writers because I knew, I knew all of these people. I mean, we lived in New York and all these people were our friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I knew they supported their families by writing stuff. I didn't want to write anything that, I didn't want to take any of their work away. But I thought, well, gosh, maybe if I make up something, I'm not taking it away from anybody. So I made a power pack and I proposed it to Shooter. And he said, well, it sounds, you know, kind of rolled his eyes and said, well, maybe we'll get a mini series out of it. Go ahead and write up, write up a proposal. So I did. And uh, June Brigman, a young artist, came into my office looking for work. And I had no work for her as an editor, but I had, um, I, I, well, I had this, this series that I wanted to get started. And I, had, I loved her work. And I said, well, can you draw kids? And she said, oh, yeah, I used to draw kids. Um, as she was a sketch artist at Six Flags in Georgia. Nice. And, and I said, OK, well, here it is. Here, take it home, do some drawings. Um, draw the kids. And if I like what you do, then I'll propose this as a team. So she came back with these adorable little drawings. And I showed him to shoot her, so gave him my proposal. And he loved it. And he said, OK, you've got a series. It's the first issue is double size, and it's due in two months. <laughs> and that was it. And then I, start, I started doing, you know, becoming more interested in writing and less interested in editing. So that was, that's the, that was a long story, Walter. Listen, I'm proud of you, honey. <laughs> it was a great also, story. I think, I okay. think you thought that if you sold Power Pack, you were going to quit your job as an editor and go freelance as a writer. And also, no, you're, you're, no, no, no. If I sold my job as Power Pack, I was going to buy a computer. Yeah, well, I knew that. I was going to say, we, we bought it. This was when word processors were just coming in. We mm -hmm. had a brand called K Pro, which are great computers for word processing. Right. The, the modern ones aren't really much better but they were great little computers for, for word processing. And so we bought our first, when Suiza sold her story, we bought our first computer. I think the K-Pro uh, was about two feet across and about a, maybe a foot and a half deep. Uh, and it was, I think around $1,800. And a dot matrix printer was about 800 or $900. So it took us, not quite three thousand dollars to get our first computer squared away and hooked up, and and then Wheezy was off to the races. Okay. Yes, nice. and then I got hired to do more writing from by by other people, and then I just wandered off and quit editing and started writing. Nice. The end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you both of you for those amazing origin stories. One thing Wheezy didn't say, I don't think, I don't know if you guys know Warren Publishing, that's the company she worked for originally when she mm -hmm. went into comics, and they did horror comics, Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella yeah. were their characters. You guys may know all this stuff since you're comics fans, but I don't know for sure, so that's, that's called an establishment shot in comic books. Yeah, well, I, my first three questions are for Wheezy specifically. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I know your name is Louise, but like, I thought you have your nickname being Wheezy, I think it's the coolest thing ever. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Wheezy, my first question for you specifically is, so when it comes to like legendary, like women working in the comic book industry, you're like the two people that I've noticed in interviews whose names came up are yours and like Jeanette Kahn, who was the, an editor and then eventually president of a DC Comics at the time. Um, so I wanted to ask you, did you face any like challenges um, as a female writer coming up in the industry? Cause you tackled a lot of like really big and important books like throughout your career in like the seventies through the nineties. So that's my. Um, I the, Well, the, I mean, the, it's funny. What, what the only thing I guess would be kind of a challenge sort of was that I know that when I came to Marvel there were, I was handed uh, most, I was handed the X-Men mm -hmm. because mm, I think people considered Chris Claremont to be difficult to work with. I thought he was a pleasure. I loved working okay. with Chris, but there were people who thought he was difficult. So um, I was handed the Chris books, which was X-Men and mm, mm, Man-Thing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I was handed a batch of licensed properties, which were Battlestar Galactica, uh, Star Wars, oh, Indiana Jones at some point, the Conan books, Micronauts, uh, probably some others that I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say, we, the re in a way, the we reason Weezy was hired at Marvel was because I think Jim felt, Jim Shooter, felt that the editors were carrying too large a burden. And so when Weezy went to work there, they took a couple of books or a book or whatever out of other editors' hands and put them in Weezy's hands. It was mostly the editors government. got to choose their books that they were giving up. Yeah. So, um, okay, so that happened. Uh, where am I? Uh, you got all these books to edit. <laughs> oh, so I had all I had, Chris's books. I had, yeah, okay, those were the books I had. Um, as time went on, you know, we, we created New Mutants from mm. X-Men. Um, and we, I, I, I started Kazar, which oh. I know that there were several, at least one editor who was completely appalled that I was allowed to get anywhere near the real Marvel universe. And, and the mutants weren't real. They weren't real Marvel characters. They were like some offshoot weird thing. Um, but God forbid I should, I should be allowed to touch, I don't know, Thor classic, the Avengers are classic Marvel books. Classic yeah. Marvel books, I know. So, oh, poor me, I got to do the X-Men. Um, so, you know, aside from that, and that wasn't really a problem either because I mean, eventually I wrote Spider-Man. So, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, it, it wasn't, it, it, it was actually kind of funny. I, like I could probably have, you know, shoved my way onto the other books if I wanted to, but I, I actually loved mutants. Mutants were really fun. So well, Chris was fun to work with yes. and, and a fount of ideas. Right. Yes. Mm. So that was, I, 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 and other than that, no, I haven't. I know there are people who have horror stories, but I really don't. I mean, I was treated like one of the guys pretty much. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm sure they were aware that I was female, but I don't think that it <laughs> made much difference to them as yeah. long as I, you know, wrote good stuff and kept away from the real Marvel books. And that was only one editor I know who was like that. The rest which, of which is good. I mean, I have good, any, um... honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it was. I mean, I will say, I mean, I know I was I was living with her at the time. We got married about the time she went freelance, but I never came across anything in the they might have told me anyway, but I never came across anything in the in the uh, offices where anybody was crabby about Wheezy as a woman doing comic books. It just wasn't that wasn't really a thing right then. No. But I will say, I, mean, I don't know if this was part of what was going on or not. There weren't very many women in comics at that time. And so it may be that they weren't regarded as a threat or they weren't regarded as maybe it's going to take my job. I mean, the way Wheezy was concerned when she started writing, she didn't want to take anybody else's job. On the other hand, when I got into comics, it never crossed my mind I'd be taking somebody else's job. Or, <laughs> you know, if they gave me work. I mean, I just didn't think like I was 25. I never thought about that. Um, you know, I didn't know the rest of these hammerheads. So what difference would it make? But, right. uh, but it hadn't crossed my mind. I just really wanted to do comics. There was a lot of, there were a lot of books. There seemed like a lot of room at the time. So I never went, I never thought about that aspect of it. But I never ran into anything where Wheezy, because we've talked about it ourselves occasionally. I don't, some of the stuff I don't have any horror stories, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that's gone on and some of the things that have happened, which are appalling to us. Mm -hmm. And yet, it, 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 she just never ran into that. Okay. Any of that stuff. You no, know, I was lucky, I guess. Yeah, it looks okay. like, I mean, which is, which is, which is good. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, I did have Jim Shooter tell me that I treated him like a kindergartner. <laughs> oh, did he act like a kindergartner? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just it was one time i don't know what i don't even know what it was we'd gotten into some kind of an we were calling him out on what it was so something I mean. like that yeah, yeah i did i mean honestly and it was it, i hadn't even what whatever i did to make him feel that way i hadn't meant to because i really respected him i thought he had a lot of really good ideas sometimes he went a little overboard in expressing them but you know i thought he was actually a really good editor-in-chief you know mo for most of the time he was there so um, I had not meant to insult him in such a way, but it, it kind of cracks me up that I said <laughs> such a thing. What a rude thing to say, you know, to do whatever it was I said to him that made him say that. Oh, <laughs> should have been ashamed of myself anyway. He was my boss. Got so. it. Well, <laughs> so.
So my next question, uh, Wheezy, uh, while doing my research, okay. you killed Superman. <laughs> I did, I did. Not, not alone. You yeah, not alone, of course. You can by yourself. It takes a team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a team to kill one of the most iconic superheroes of all time. Uh, you got but, the village of assassins. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to know, um, like, give me some more insight on what it was like to work on probably the most iconic hit moments in, like, comic book history. And, like, and my a, a question for this is, did you want him to stay dead? we don't want him to stay dead. We don't want him to stay dead. I mean, honestly, okay, for in when you're working in superhero comics for uh with, with characters that you don't own. I mean, these are the company owns these characters. You can't just do things to them and then just leave it that way and expect them to always stay that way for one thing. I mean, we knew that when we killed him, he would get better. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I I have never killed a character that I didn't know how I would bring them back. Except for Superman. And I figured that really that was up to the team. I, I, it was not up to me alone to bring him back. <laughs> um, the, way, the way the Superman books worked, it was very different from the books, the way I had worked at Marvel. I mean, at Marvel, you were handed a book and you pretty much had total control of it with the editor's approval, of course. I mean, the, the editor was there to approve the plots and you know if you did something wonky they were there to point it out to you and make sure you got paid and you know just make your life easier as a creative human being um at but you you had this one little book and you were and you sort of steered it as you chose um when i went over to work for superman there were three other superman books um, and each of the books themselves, each issue was treated treated as a chapter in a longer story. So sometimes you would do the middle of the story, the beginning of the story, the end of the story, depending on how it fell. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really the stories that we told were up to the creative team. That was all of us. I mean, we would have a meeting every year a really big meeting with the writers and the pencilers and the inkers and either the colorists, the letterers and the editors and assistant editors. This big, in this big old boardroom and we'd all sit around this big table with this chart up in the front and it was the assistant assistant editor's jobs. There's several assistants that, went, that we went through this where you know they, they would have to write down the, I guess the suggestions, what the stories were going to be about. And we would all bring our ideas for things that would make good stories. And we would throw them out and people would say yes or no, or the editor, editor was Mike Carlin, who, and it was, he was probably the only guy who could have pulled this off because in a, a room full of freelancers, it's like being the ringmaster in a circus. Not everybody got along all that well either. I mean, mostly we got along, but there were a few of us who butted heads. And, you know, it was the, a whip and a chair you need, as well as, um, you know, good people skills. So, um, so my, anyway, Mike, Mike acted as the ringmaster for this thing. And we, we, would, we would say, oh, blah, 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 this and that and the other. We would work out a continuity, you know, three issue arc for this story and then blah, blah, blah. And, what, and then we would work out um, subplots and put those in. Um, it, but it would be in very broad strokes so that then, you would, you would kind of get your list of things that you had to incorporate in your book, and but you could do it any way you wanted to, just make a good story out of it. Okay. And then that, so that you had to do, you, if, if you were going to write, plot a book, you had to plot it within a week because it, you couldn't stop the flow of traffic. The book, at that point, the book, the, your plot went to the next person who would read the plot and do their story having knowing, known what you did. Now, and Mike Carlin, because computers were not as reliable then as they are now, um, he would, he, he and his assistant, his assistant, I guess would have this horrible job, would have to collate everything that went into the office and staple it all together and put it in order and then send these packages out to us. We would get these packages every week filled with a list of what everybody else had done. 
and you know, and we would know what we were then expected to do, and we would do it. Um, so it was kind of these were what Xerox copies he was sending. Xerox us copies of everything, yeah. So Xerox everything and, sent it, and stapled it. Was, it. It's, it was yeah. an insane way to work, but actually worked for us. Um, up to the point where we had, we were working toward Lois and Clark getting married. And we spent two or three days working up a continuity on our chart and it was all pretty. And we said, all right, we'll call in the publisher and let her see it. it was Jeanette, speaking of Jeanette. And she said, oh, but you can't get them married. We have a TV show coming up and they won't be married in the TV show. And if they're married, it will confuse the audience. And we said, so you just have to go back and think of something else. And it was like, oh, bad Fun. word. <laughs> Fun. So, so we were all sitting around rather glum because we'd spent a lot of time on this. And, um, and Jerry Ordway, who's one of the, I can't remember at that point, he was a writer or an artist or both because Jerry's very multi-talented, said, as he did every year, what are we going to do? Oh, let's kill him. And Jerry said, hmm, let's kill him. And we said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he deserves to die. <laughs> so we we came up with the death of Superman storyline actually very quickly, wow. um, and uh, you know, and then that was that was that. I mean, and, and using that same procedure, and um, and then back into the uh, the merry-go-round of getting these giant packets. Where where we're, I mean, and, and very tightly we had, at that point we were very tightly linked together because every issue was quite clearly a chapter in this saga of, it was moving up toward the death of Superman and then World Without Superman and then Return of Superman. So that was, we spent a couple of years, you know, like, you know, all crowded together doing the same stuff, which was a little wearing. But then, mm -hmm. but then we did, oh gosh, I guess when we did the, um, World Without Superman, then we came, we came up with a, a project where we did each of us had a Superman that we could play with and we weren't as tightly mm -hmm. linked and we were like oh thank goodness a little breathing room and that was okay too the end okay do yeah. I have to <laughs> that answer your question no that was very insightful <laughs> very wow right, everyone right just long-winded just kill Superman <laughs> <You got it. laughs> um I'm gonna ask Walt a question then yes, we'll move please. on to audience questions so <laughs> Walt, um, you're obviously known for, you've done obviously, I said, worked on books like Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, all that other cool stuff, but you're mostly known for your Thor run. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, and essentially, because you also have this book, Ragnarok, that you mentioned that you do for IDW. Um, so I just want to know, like, what it like, why do you love, like, Norse mythology so much and, like, gives you to, like, what attracts you to, like, to write about these characters and stories involving Norse mythology? Well, they're, they're so cool. They all die at the end. So that's <laughs> not true of most mythologies. Um, I will say, just a quick note, I have not done Spider-Man. Oh, my fault. One, Sorry. He's probably the one classic Marvel character I've never touched. I mean, the others I haven't done much with. A little bit here, a little bit there. And I've drawn Spider-Man once or twice. Yeah, you covered. did a really nice drawing of Spider-Man. You, your Spider-Man would have been great if you'd ever done him. Well, about a year, year and a half ago, I did a Spider-Man cover, a variant cover that came out really well. Um, although maybe Spy was a little too buff. I have to have him gone back and had him lose weight some. I have, I'm not used to drawing these thinner characters. But uh, and I forgot, well, the Ragnarok and the mythology. Um, I've always loved myths. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this has anything to do with it. I don't really claim any genetic predisposition, but my grandparents, my father's parents came over from Scandinavia. They were, they were immigrants to this country, mm -hmm. uh, came in through uh, Maine, I think, or something like that. But they were part of the Scandinavian migration that went from, uh, came into the country and went to Minnesota and North Dakota. So that um, you, go the, you go back to the old graveyards up in North Dakota where my grandfather lived, and the graveyard is just all gravestones of Anderson and Simonson and so and so. Son. It's just all these Scandinavian names. So I could claim a little of that maybe uh, behind me. Uh, but as a kid, I can remember you know, maybe in fifth grade uh, coming across a book. I'd give a nickel to see that book again, but it was a textbook at school, uh, literature book, or at least stories for kids to read. And that was my first encounter with Beowulf. And it was the story of Beowulf illustrated. I don't remember much about that now. I remember the dragon that comes at the end that kills Beowulf. 
which I think was quite a surprise to me that the hero died, even if he was an old guy by then. Um, I found other books on myths, uh, I, the Greek myths, I uh, had some kids books. And it turned out that my parents, my dad had a nice little library at home and he had a book, mm, it might've been Gods and Myths of Northern Lands. It's got a couple of different names. H.R. Gruber wrote it. I only discovered in the last 15 years, H.R. Gruber was a woman. Mostly it was, I think she had initials because that way it wasn't obvious it was a woman when the book came out in 1892. Mm. So they had a copy printed from back then, which when I was a kid wasn't as long ago as it is now, but still a long time ago. And it was really an adult book. It was not a kid's book. Um, had all kinds of quotes from the elder Edda and some of the sagas and the younger Edda. Uh, and I, of which I knew nothing at the time. And it wasn't really, that part wasn't excessively footnoted. So I didn't know where these were coming from. I thought they were really cool. They had a bunch of illustrations. The illustrations actually were hysterical. I, as I got older, I realized that because they have all the Norse myths, the gods, but they're all, they're all sort of dressed in robes in all these kind of classical positions as if they were <laughs> Greek sculptures. So they clearly have a lot of Greek influence in the paint drawings, these black and white drawings that were being done for the book. But the book had, you know, it was not a kid's book, it had a lot of material in it. Um, I'm not sure where some of it came from to this day, but it was still, it was fascinating. And really the fact that at the end, the gods meet, they go out to meet their doom was quite compelling to me when I was young. I just thought, you know, of course, when you're young, death's a long way away, mostly. And so it has a different look to it. Like it would have a different look to you guys than it will to me if we were to compare notes. But it was really, it was fascinating. And the fact that each God went up against his, his opposite sort of at the end uh, and they slew each other. Uh, the whole story of Ragnarok itself, which is not very long in the poetry, is just an incredibly powerful story. I loved it. And so uh, when I was in college, my sophomore year, between my sophomore and, and, and my freshman and sophomore year, so I, what does that make me, 18? Yeah, my birthday's in September, so it was, I would have been 18, uh, going on 19. I, I stumbled across a couple of Journey into Mystery comics in a local... Uh, drugstore, drug fair, it was called, I think, uh, a few miles from my home. There weren't a lot of comics available, and there were no Marvel comics anywhere, except it turned out in drug fairs. And so I found a pair of Thor comics, Journey the Mystery 120 and 121. They were on the stand at the same time, which they shouldn't have been. They should have taken the one off when they put the new one up, but they were both there. It turned out to be parts one and two of a four-part story, the only four-part story that Stan and Jack did. And it was right as Jack was hitting his stride visually with those characters of 65. And I was floored. It was uh, Loki was plotting to take over the uh, Asgard as he always was, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that then. I had never seen him before. And uh, there's a shot of him sitting in his chair and his arms are up and he's got some stuff. He's looking at the camera or close by saying something along the lines of the players are in, in, the, in the position, the, tr the play is ready the tragedy is about to begin. That's not really quite how we phrase it, but that's close. And so for something I read 50 years ago, not bad. So maybe longer than that. Um, I was blown away by them. So I picked them up um, and then I went back to college uh, in New England and I, I knew nothing about buying comics in the little town I was in. So I rummaged around. I found there was a little tobacco store, Augie's Tobacco Shop that had tobacco, cigars, cigarettes, uh, a whole wall of paperback books down one side, a really good rack of magazines, a big rack of magazines, and a very large like triangular spinner rack that had, I don't know, four or five comics in, on each side, had a lot of comics. So I would go by there looking for the comic. Uh, I never found the next issue, which was what, 122. Didn't find it. And at the end of 121, Thor's fighting the absorbing man. The Absorbing yeah. Man has come back for the second time. I didn't know that either then. And at the end of the comic, just as they're fighting, Thor looks over and this little kid has run out into the street and he runs over and grabs the kid and puts the kid over here. And then the Absorbing Man clocks him with his giant ball and chain from behind. Mm -hmm. And he's lying there on the ground completely. And the Absorbing Man has his arms in a Jack Kirby position up over his head. Ha ha, only someone as strong as Thor could beat Thor himself. 
and I didn't know anything about comics back then, and it's not quite like that. And I went, oh my God, what happened? And I went, I went, I won't say that here because it's going to be on YouTube. I could say it, but yeah, I went back there. <laughs> so basically, I haunted Augie's, never found the comic. I finally wrote Marvel Comics a letter, which as I've said elsewhere, I'm very glad I don't have a copy of because I'm sure it was so pleading and obsequious as to be disgusting reading. But I wrote them and I asked, was there, you know, there were no comic shops back then. Uh, there were very few back issues available. There were people I discovered who sold comics out of their mom's basement and they would have long lists in point, four point type in comic books and newsprint that would tell what comics they had for sale. And I remember I didn't buy a copy of Fantastic Four number one because for God's sake, it was $7. Mm. Who was going to spend seven dollars for one lousy comic book? I thought I'm I'm not doing that. Yeah. Not my smartest move. But I didn't know any of that stuff at the time, so I wrote Marvel, and uh, ultimately, I got a Manila envelope in the mail one day from New York City, and I don't know if it said Marvel on the outside or not. But I opened it up, and it was a mint copy of Journey to Mystery One Twenty Two. There was a little note that came with it. That it was just a pre printed note that says, Dear blank, thanks for letting you hear from us, blah, 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 Excelsior Stan, or whatever it said. And there was a little bit of handwriting on it. It said, Dear Walter. And then at the bottom, it said, Couldn't let you down. Hope you enjoy the comic. I was a Marvel fan from that minute on. Wow. That second, I went nuts. And, and then I discovered at the end of the comic, they hadn't really gone much further than where they were, you know, the, the first splash page is Thor getting back up going, doesn't he suspect I was merely stunned? You know, I'm going, really, that's it? That was the whole deal? And then they fight again for a whole comic book. And at the end, they're still fighting. So it goes on for one more issue, which I picked up and got the end of the story. And it was actually pretty cool, if a little long. But uh, I was just, I was blown away that they sent me the copy. Um, for a number of years after that, when I got into comics professionally, I have sent comics to people. Don't send me a note now. Anybody's watching this because I'm not. <laughs> just so you know. Well, now I don't. I don't need to. Now it's all available digitally. It's mm -hmm. all in reprints. Back then it was hard to find them, and I did send out a number of comics to people who wrote couldn't find mm -hmm. stuff. I had extra copies. So anyway, that was really <clears throat> somewhere in there. I became a Berserko comic reader, especially Marvel. Within three months, I was buying every Marvel comic coming out. You know, which back then was like ten titles at 35 cents each. Even I in college could afford that at the time. And uh, what happened was I was in college as a geology major to study paleontology and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. At the end of my time in college, I decided not to do that. I didn't have any other ideas. It wasn't like I had some other plan. I didn't have another plan. Uh, I graduated, I took a year off um, and ultimately decided to go to art school because besides dinosaurs, my only other interest was drawing pictures. I'd taken a few art courses, hadn't liked them mostly. I didn't want to be told what to draw or what to do. I didn't care about making toothpick constructions. I didn't pay yeah. about, care about doing paper mache. I just wanted a pencil and a piece of paper. And so I went to art school, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. I learned an enormous amount when I was there. I was, I was there as a transfer student for three years. And while I was there, I began writing and drawing what would eventually become a 50 page comic called the Star Slammers, which was a science, a science fiction pulp, space mercenaries. And that the first half of it, I've said people to people, it's not bad fan work. And the second half is early professional work. I got mm -hmm. better. Those two years, my improvement was vast over the time I was doing that. And a lot of what I learned at RISD, I was incorporating into the comics. I learned the love of lettering and sound effects and just and fonts when I was there, it's one of the reasons I do fonts is I learned so much about them when I was there and loved letter forms. I love their apparent simplicity and their sophistication. And the fact that the space between them is as important as the form of the letter itself. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff I picked up while I was there. I did printmaking. I was a silk screener for a while. I assisted in the silk screen class. I was an assistant to the professor and I can't use that in comics. I learned an enormous amount about patience because you find if you lay down one color of ink in a silk screen, you're going to do a 14 color uh, print. 
you can't go back until the print the ink is completely dry exactly because if you do that you'll lay on the next ink you'll pick up your screen and right around the edge of your new color it will dissolve the old color and pick it right up and all these white dots will appear along the margin of the mm -hmm. two colors where it's picked up the ink off the paper and the paper is showing through so you have to be patient i i took a painting course i was not patient in painting i did a lot of great paintings that were awful and they were all in brown because I put every <laughs> color up on the canvas at the same time. And the professor never came around and said, don't do that. Mm. So I didn't think it was a great professor, but I've forgotten his name. It's good. I can't, I can't bad mouth him now. But uh, silk screening, the print told you that you were rushing too fast, mm -hmm. that you had to slow down. And so you just, yeah, I said, I'm doing a, I did like 14 colors or thereabouts, 13 maybe was the most, different ink colors I put in a single print and I took a you know a couple of weeks to get that one done maybe longer um but I learned a great deal I was at busy and then the star slammers work the second half of it became my portfolio when I went into DC comics and showed Bernie and Michael and Howard and Dan my portfolio that's the work that I had and that's the work that uh Carmine saw and that's the work that he made his editors give me uh new uh, new stories on the one thing i did learn I, I had learned it earlier kind of by accident is that science fiction comics back in those days was a very small ghetto over in one side and there was a they weren't a lot of people doing it there weren't a lot of people publishing it there weren't a lot there wasn't a lot of work in that and i realized that if i got typed as a science fiction artist i would not do well i mean i'd get a few jobs here and there but i would not have a career and so i worked hard to persuade Archie Goodwin, actually, to let me have a couple of stories that weren't uh, in the uh, in that line of country, and that that worked out. I did one story. Uh, a friend of mine wrote six months in, five months in, four months in, maybe on the Alamo, and it was a story about the Alamo, uh, in which it's a true story, in which one of the defenders of the Alamo, part of the way through the siege, which was what thirteen days, I think, and he rode out from the Alamo and broke through the Mexican lines and went looking for reinforcements for help because there were about 186 defenders in the Alamo and about 4,000 Mexican troops, which were bad odds, even inside of the Alamo. And the guy went, couldn't find anybody. Nobody was gonna come help him. And so instead of saying, gosh, look at the time, I could be in California in three months <laughs> and taken off, he rode back through the Mexican lines and he rode back into the Alamo to tell them that there was no help coming. And then he died, as, as everybody did, he died on the last day and the final day when the Mexicans overwhelmed the uh, mm -hmm. fortress. So Don, Don Carr was the writer. Don wrote that story, it was a little three-pager, very short, and I drew it. It's not a job that I'm happy to see reprinted. It's not bad, it's, you know, honestly, it was the best job I could do at the time. That's what you have to do. You're, you do the best job you can in the time you've got, in, in the, uh, your abilities, and in the time you've got. Time is always a factor in getting a freelance job done. And so I drew it. Um, it's not bad, it's not awful, it's not great, but I only found out later, it was for Archie, for one of Archie's war books, and I only found out later that that was the job that persuaded Archie that I could draw stuff besides rocket ships. So shortly thereafter, when he decided to put a new backup feature in Detective Comics, namely Manhunter, I was mm -hmm. the guy he asked to draw it. So there was a milestone in my career. I had no idea. I just, I made the right move for the right reasons, but without really quite, you don't have any idea how it's going to turn out. And it just, it worked out very well for me. Good. Good, good, good. Wow. More than you wanted to know, I realized. No, no, listen, as it, it was it was nice. nodding off now. Yeah, no, it's fine. We we're all engaged. Don't <laughs> worry about it. Um, yeah. So I I I have a ton more question to ask you guys, but um, two, two in particular that involves characters that you created. But I want to open it to uh, the people in the Zoom right now. So if y'all could do like a thumbs up reaction, like down on the screen, so I can like call on you to see who wants to. Oh, look at that, Artie. I haven't seen that before in my Zoom call. All right. Um, yeah, we'll do a Declan. Declan. Um, hello. I just like to say you both are very great speakers. Like, <clears throat> I could listen to you guys speak all day. Oh, but, well, thank um, you. So I wanted to ask, 
what it's like seeing your um, creations transformed into a different medium. Like, uh, for instance, the death of Superman becoming an animated film. What is that process like to the original creators? <laughs> you know, it depends on how good a job any, how good an adaptation, I guess, of, of, of the, 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 that, has, that appears on the screen. Um, you know, I've had some things that I've kind of liked the look of and some that I haven't. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really, it depends on which, I mean, it's, it's kind of exciting to think that anybody wants to make a movie or TV show of any uh, about anything that you made up. I mean, we're just making this stuff up. We have no idea that eventually, you know, somebody might want to make movies out of it. But um, so, I mean, it can be exciting or it can be horrifying depending on, on what, what's done with it. Um, at least that's my opinion. How about you, Walter Darling? That's, I mean, that's about right. You, you'd like to see it done well. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Um, I'm not going to discuss the ones that aren't because I, I, I don't want to, you know. Apocalypse. <laughs> well, I didn't invent him, so I'm okay on that. But, but he was awful. Um, I will say the re he wasn't featured in the movie much, but the redesign of Archangel for the movie was great. The actual design was fabulous. It was I pretty did, cool. You know, kind of spun out of what I'd done and it was really well done. He looked great. So Apocalypse looked way better in Jackson Geis's original design with my steroids in the character. Yeah. I, I beefed him up a great deal when I took over the book. I mean, Jackson drew him very briefly, but he did create the character. And I jacked him up a lot when I was began doing X Factor. Um, Jackson had forgotten I, that he even- He had forgotten. Character, which is funny. And well, yeah, at one point he was asked, this is many years ago about creating, I said, oh, well, Walt did that. And I went, no, no, you did that. I went, oh, I guess I did. So it was kind of funny. Um, but I thought the, you know, the redesign, and I'm sorry for the designers out there. If you happen to see this, I'm really sorry, but it was not a great job. Um, I was in the San Diego con, oh, I don't know, it must've been six, seven, eight years ago now. I was out there and Wheezy was not with me at the time. Well, not on the street. I was crossing over the street to get to my hotel. And if you've ever been there, there there's one e exit entrance on the sidewalk that funnels people into the, across the street. And it's just, it's always a madhouse while the con is running. It's just this, you know, it's worse than the subway at, new, at, at rush hour because there's just billions of people and they're all in the same spot. Or it's like all the guys in the subway at rush hour in this, you know, much, much smaller space. But as I was walking across, I looked ahead and kind of across the, beyond the crossing, there was a guy in an apocalypse costume based on the original design. And the guy was, he must've been six, 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 eight. I couldn't see the bottom half because there were 8 million people around me but it was just fantastic. I think I've seen it. Great. And I thought, <laughs> so when I saw the movie, I thought, you hammerheads, you had this great design and this is what you came up with? So, and I, I also thought the subtly, the character that Wheezy created was not the character in the films. I mean, I get it. You know, he's a, a, a power mad guy going to take over the world or whatever he was doing. We did see that movie. Um, but we don't see a lot of them. I mean, there are a lot of movies we don't go to see. We don't, you know, if I, I'm not the right audience for superhero movies at this point, I'm kind of beyond the demographic as you guys are not. Um, so we've seen some of the series, oh, some of the early Marvels, which I really enjoyed. I enjoyed a lot of those quite a bit, um, but there are a lot of them we have not seen. For example, I haven't seen any Avengers film since the first one. We like that a lot. We just don't get around to it much. Um, I would like to see the Black Panther, when it came out, we were living for a winter in North Carolina and the nearest movie theater that was showing it was a 70 mile round trip. And I like movies, but I wasn't really ready to make a 70 mile round trip to go see one. So that's, you know, you ask about it. There are a lot of movies that we have not seen. Um, like being in a movie though, didn't you darling? Yeah, well, being in the movie was kind of fun. I'm in the first. Oh, yeah. I'm in the first Thor film for yeah. a nanosecond. Wheezy is in the movie for even less time than I oh. am. And less of me, th this much. <laughs> I'm sorry. If, uh, if you watch the film, we're both in the banquet scene. Actually, my editor, oh, okay. Ralph Macchio, who's my editor in the book, in the latter stages of the book, 
was in the movie as well. And Ralph's on it even less than Wheezy. I'm not sure you can see Ralph except for the back of his head. Yeah. But they, the actually gave head me, they gave me a split second of actual screen time where A, my beard wasn't quite as white. B, I had more, a little more hair, not a lot more, a little more hair. And I wasn't wearing glasses because apparently Asgardians don't wear glasses. So, mm. <laughs> which was okay, that was fine. Um, but they were very nice. They, they wanted me to come out and be in the film. Um, they also wanted Weezy to come. Um, our best guess on that is that I don't like flying. I will do it. I've done it. I've gone through stages where I just don't want to fly and I don't for a couple of years. And then I go, eh, screw it. You know, so I, and I'll get in the plane and go. And I, you know, it's been fine. Um, two years ago, we went to Lucca over in Italy and we flew into what was essentially a hurricane on the Italian coast. And we were bouncing all over the sky. And we were bouncing so badly. The pilot actually came off like a 727, 730, probably 737, that size airplane, not a giant plane. And uh, we were flying in from England on that, so it wasn't a large aircraft. And he came on to reassure us that the airplane was built to handle stresses like that. And I have never ridden in such rough weather that the pilot had to reassure the, the people on the plane that, no, no, we're going to be able to land and we'll be alive. They came so, down the aisle handing out barf bags. And I needed mine. So, and I was on was really disgusting. So we were bouncing all over the place. Weezy was across the aisle from me and I was hanging onto the seat in front of me while we were bouncing like crazy. And I looked at my wife and I said, I am never fucking doing this again. <laughs> now, I have flown since then, so I guess I forgot. But it was tough. That was a rugged, that was a rugged flight. Um, but we think they invited Weezy to come out because they figured I probably wouldn't go if it was just me. And that's probably true. I, think that's probably I, li true. I mean, I like movies. What's that, Weez? I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I like movies. Um, I don't watch a million. I mean, we might go see three movies in a year, if that. So there are a million movies we haven't seen. I, I watch a few on cable once in a while, but usually weird, strange, oddball films. Recently, we watched a, a, a Criterion disc. There's a film called House or Hose or something like that. It's Japanese, Japanese horror film. It is the weirdest movie you were ever going to see. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Weezy sort of got sucked into it. And I think she enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I did. I ended up watching the whole thing. Watching the whole thing. I, it's very odd. It's really strange. And so I like some goofy movies like that, strange movies like that. Um, but if it had just been me and invited out there to go be in the movie, I probably wouldn't have gone. Just because I don't want to fly for 10 hours so I can be in a film. I don't care. Um, but, uh, but now I am, Weezy went out, I went out. They actually gave me, a, there was a nanosecond. I, I, I got, we got to meet everybody on the film except for Natalie Portman. They were shooting uh, Asgardian stuff. So she yeah. was not there. And that, uh, I didn't meet Anthony Hopkins. He was not, he was actually, it turned out he was there but we didn't meet him. We were, when Ralph and I were walking back they actually gave us a dressing room which was an unused office that had some furniture nobody was using around the edges. But they gave us a dresser so she could help us get our, our had full costumes. We had sewn leather shoes that you can't see because you're seeing about as much of me right now as I saw in the you saw in the movie. I'm sitting at a banquet table, so it was a complete costume. I had these leather gauntlets that ran up my arm of stiff, stiff leather, and they were so stiff. And my arms are a little short that they stuck in my elbows. So I tried to bend my arm in order to eat food. I couldn't quite get to my mouth. It was like I got so I would toss a grape in because that I could do. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it was really, it was a really interesting experience. It made making movies look like it would be fun. And one of the women that we met, we met a woman who, we met everybody who was on set. Uh, she was the vocal coach for everybody to get all their accents to be kind of in the same range or whatever. And uh, her take on this, she'd done a lot of movies and all over the world. And her take on that, was the fish rots from the head down. And that meant that the director set the tone. And Kenneth Branagh was great. He was really, he was very kind to us. Um, when we were getting ready to film the banquet scene, I was at one end of the table, Wheezy and Ralph were at the other end of the table. And uh, he asked us to stand up and he introduced us to the entire, all the cast. The, the banquet table had an entire row of extras sitting on with their, essentially their backs to the camera they'd shoot past them and look at the Warriors Three and Thor and all the other guys sitting on the other side, on the named side of the table, apparently. 
And so we got, apparently, they handed out my run of Thor to almost everybody. I don't know how many of them read it, but I gather Brown had read it. So they had that, uh, they had that available to everybody. And it was, so they were very kind. They were very sweet. Um, and we had a nice time. We got there for about three days. Um, got to watch them film uh, the gods landing in Jotunheim when they zip in. They don't really zip in quite the same way, but they land. The soundstage was a giant, gigantic soundstage. And all that snowfield they're walking on is uh, cut up plywood all painted white. I'm sure it had all been computered up by the time they did it. But they had a, just a green screen, green curtains around the entire back. Banquet hall was the same way. They had a banquet hall. They had this table we were sitting at. There were columns behind it, and there were green curtains hanging between the columns to add in Asgard once the live filming was done. Um, they had Odin's bed was still there. I got to lie in Odin's bed, although it was nice. uncomfortable because they'd already taken the mattress off. They were beginning to break the set down. So I had to lie in the plywood base, but it was still cool to lie in Odin's bed. And uh, we, uh, we saw the beginning, they had about half or a third of Heimdall's globe done for the rainbow bridge. They'd begun putting all this foam pattern stuff on the walls to make it all into a pattern. They hadn't quite, hadn't finished that yet. So we saw that, those are the ones I can remember. I don't know if there's anything else. Um, one thing we did see that I just thought, oh man, I would have, I would have stolen that in a heartbeat if I could got it, gotten under my coat. They took us around and showed us some of the workshops where they were doing, doing paintings and digital work and model building and all kinds of stuff. We saw some of the Captain America stuff, which hadn't come out yet. They were nice. working on that. That's the next movie, I guess, or whatever, whenever it was coming up. But they actually had a full-size Balder helmet. Now, Balder's not in the movie. Mm. And I don't know what the plans were for, were, were for mm. him, but they actually had the helmet that I put on him in the miniseries, right? Or actually it was in the comic, I think, with these big flange things sticking out and out of foam or something like that. I was so tempted to steal it, but I managed to. <laughs> it was very cool to see. It was really, I mean, it was really a very enjoyable three days. We have some friends out in LA, so we saw some friends as well. Tom yeah. Hiddleston was wonderful. What's that? Tom, yeah, who played Love Me, just oh, the best. I love him. I yep. was just like, ah, oh, I wanted to take him home with me. <laughs> was so it was not me in a heartbeat. <laughs> it was really yeah. fun, fun seeing him play against um, uh, Chris, what, Chris Helmsworth, too. Yeah. Chris was, they were great together, I thought. And, and Lo, at one point, Loki, uh, Tom was showing Wheezy, uh, and there were a couple other girls there as well. Loki's fighting style. So he was doing this whole dance around where he would materialize knives in his hand and then fire them off. And, then, and that's in the movie for about a half a second. Mm. We had worked out this whole <laughs> choreography about how Loki would fight. It was great. It was really, I mean, he was, he was, he was really great. They were all very nice to us, actually. I mean, they're all the cast members. Um, Ray Stevenson, is that correct? Stevenson, is that right? Or Stevens? <laughs> Oh, I'm not sure now. Ray Stevenson, yeah, I, think, I believe so. Uh, but he, uh, we were during the, we took a break during the eating scene, and he and I ended up talking, and he, he told me that I should not actually eat anything. You have to fake it, because he said in the first movie he was ever in, there was an eating scene, and so he ate, and it turned out they shot all day, and by the end of the day he was ready to explode. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a tip from a professional actor. For my next appearance if I have to do an eating scene. So I ate most of my grapes by sticking my tongue in my cheek and you know chewing on it like that. Mm, it was fun. It. it was they were just very nice. It was we had a lot of fun while we were out there. Thanks for sharing that. That's crazy with the whole Thor experience. And um also that cosplay you saw is made by the uh cinema makeup school in LA. And it's I know what you're talking about. It's um, the apocalypse cosplay, it's amazing. That, okay. um, All right. Yeah. Um, no, so who's next for, I think Robert had a question. All right. Uh, so this is for, his name was not on the screen. Ah, oh, there we are. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Robert. So this is for, uh, Wheezy. Okay. Um, Good. yeah. So one of the first comics I ever read was like the death and return of Superman. Uh, and so when I read it, I didn't have like, I didn't really know much about comics. So the whole like impact of it, but now later I learned that like, it was kind of like actual newspapers were running the story that people killed Superman. So what was it like being like <laughs> releasing this like big bombshell of story that like actual newspapers were writing about you killed a fictional character? 
we who worked on the, that particular project were actually a little surprised. Um, I mean, we knew it was going to be a good story. Uh, I, we had no way of knowing that, that newspapers would get involved. It was, I think it must've been a, you know, a slow news day. Nothing, nothing important happened except for us killing Superman. Um, you know, it, I had known from, um, I guess from back when I did the X-Men, uh, the, and the death of Jean Grey, and then the days of future past. After the death of Jean, Jean Grey, the uh, um, retailers, I guess, the, the people, the comic book shops would call and they'd say, okay, we've heard that everybody is gonna die. What issue does everybody die? Because we wanna order extra copies. And I said, oh, death sells. Oh, that's cool. So um, later on when it got to be time to kill Superman. Um, I mean, we didn't kill Superman because we thought we were gonna sell lots of comics. Although if I had thought about it, I guess I would have realized that, you know, it, it was a possibility that it would sell more. Um, it never occurred to us that the media would get as involved as it did. We had a friend in Paris who was, uh, Jeff Darrow, who, was, who had taken, he was in a cab somewhere and the cabbie found out that he was an American. And I think that he did comics too. And he started berating Jeff about the evil of the Americans who had actually killed Superman. And Jeff, of course, had to call us and tell us. And that was, that was it. Okay. I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing I, to do yes, with it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm Edison, Edison, Edison. Um, <laughs> which is amusing. Um, yes, yeah, slow, slow news. We got lucky. It was a slow news day. And um, you know, the it, it we got got publicity that you just couldn't buy. Uh, it turned out that because Superman is a licensed and licensable property, there were a number of people who were using Superman in their advertising who had not been informed that Superman was going to die. And I believe that in, what was the magazine, Walter? Was it Life Magazine? Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was like Us Magazine or People or one of those, one of those pop magazines of you know, modern pop culture. They had an ad with Superman, like energize, what well, energize their batteries, they last as long as Superman and with <laughs> Superman busting his chains. And later on the issue was like, yes, yeah, Superman's dead. <laughs> So you can imagine that the um, advertisers were not completely delighted with this necessarily. And at first they tried to kill it. The, the, the people in um, who were, I guess, in charge of publicity at DC were actually kind of appalled at this reaction because they had all of these other people that, you know, people they had licensed Superman to and now Superman was dead. Oh my God, you know, everybody's mad at them. So they tried to kill the publicity. They were told that if they, if anybody called and asked about it, they were not to give them any information and blah, 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 and you know, do the best they could to, to tone it down. And then they saw that the comic started selling and it was like the money was pouring in and all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, he died and we're going to you know, promote it and stuff like that. So that, that worked out for us in the long run. We, we actually were lucky on that too. I suppose it was good that it was success or most we would all probably, have been in trouble. Probably the most publicity Superman got since the very first film came out in 70, yeah. 70 or 78. It was yeah. just, you know, it was everywhere. When I was watching the news that night, Tom Brokaw was on NBC and the last story that night had a picture of a Todd McFarlane Superman drawing that Todd had done for me for a Superman comic I had done where I got my friends to do a pinup for me. I had a Jeff Darrow pinup and a Todd McFarlane pinup. I, I forgot who else, John, I don't know who else was in there, but they used that drawing and announced that Superman was either dying or was dead. I forgot where it, you know, when the, the news broke and uh, I just kind of went, I was like, wow, it really is a slow news day. No, you, and, you just don't expect that. And you, that's, you can't buy that kind of stuff. You catch lightning in a bottle. There's, and it was, but DC really tried to, you know, I mean, the thing is that DC, the, the higher ups in the food chain at DC had not found out about this storyline 
in time to kill it. If they had found out about it, that would never have come out. It would have been the second death. It was the, Clark's marriage is down. <laughs> Superman's death is down. But luckily, yeah. Well, by the time out. they discovered, it was too late. It was already you know, yeah. it was in being released, so they were stuck with it. And it turned out to be a big PR thing for them, but they didn't think that in the beginning. Which it was, you know, for us. I mean, for Weezy and me and everybody who works in comics, it was a surprise. I think partly because we're used to killing characters. Characters die and get better all the time. But this guy dies, well, he'll get better in a couple of issues. Or I mean, yeah. that's just, that's one of the tropes in the in the mainstream uh, socially collective material in comics where it's a creatively a collective creative in comics that's one of the things you can do and so we've all done it and you know this is one more character the fact it was superman turns out to have a much bigger resonance which just we well i don't think i've really been thought of at the creative level because you're you do this all the time but, but it worked out pretty well for the world. I mean, we didn't do it because we thought we were going to get rich. We did it because we thought it would be a good story and we had to think of something fast. Um, One of the things that's funny is occasionally you get, you get fans who will say, oh, this was just a cynical ploy to make money. And I think, well, isn't that my job? <laughs> isn't my job to try and sell comic books? And honestly, if I could sell numbers like the death of Superman every month, don't you think I'd be doing every damn thing in the book that would work? I did Wonder Woman for six issues once, many years ago now, as a fill-in between creative guys. Uh, Phil Jimenez was doing the book and he was getting off the book and Greg Rucka was taking the book over as a writer. But they were six months apart. Phil was getting off, Greg was getting on. I was offered the book to write for six months. So I wrote a self-contained story um, in it. Uh, Wonder Woman, it was kind of a tip of the hat to some books I liked in Wonder Woman back in the 60s. And in it, she wakes up and has no memory of who she is and no powers. And so she, but she uh, becomes aware of very, well, no, no powers like her ropes, her lasso's gone and her tiara is gone, stuff like that. But she went and she discovers very rapidly that someone, some force is out to kill her. And so she has to skip town basically and try and keep ahead of the bad guys, whoever they might be, until she can figure out who they are and how to counter them. So one of the first things she does, I mean, I've seen the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. So one of the first things she does is she gets a haircut. She's got this great long black hair. So I had it cut short. I had a, I had a young, actually a young black girl who was a hairdresser, becomes a friend of hers, and Becca cuts her hair. And that made news stations all over the country. Every, every, every station that had a pop culture page on their station had the AP, I got interviewed with the AP, somebody else, I think, and all wire services, they were still wire services then, got it. And that article about that haircut on the Wonder Woman was everywhere. Now, I hadn't thought about it. I just thought, look, if I'm a fugitive, I'm gonna do three, well, I'm gonna cut my hair, now I'm gonna get a wig, but I'll get a wig, I'll get, I'll get some contact lenses and I'll shave, trim my beard and mustache. And if I keep my trap shut, Nobody will know who I am. So that was her, first, that seemed like the first logical move in trying to avoid pursuit until you could figure out who it was and how you could deal with it. And in the end, uh, I, did a, I did a bit where, I did it in a Thor as well. When Beta Ray Bill has uh, the cane that he gets from, that takes from Don Blake and smashes it against the wall and suddenly boom, he's transformed into Beta Ray Bill. He has kind of a variant Thor costume on. It's a little more science fiction-y. Um, and it's not so much that the cane is a tailor that gives you a better suit of clothes. It's really because comics at that time were monthly. There were very few reprints. When they came out, they were gone the next month. So you tried to use visual cues to enlarge what you were telling, the stories you were telling. So when that happens to Beta Ray Bill and his costume changes and the stick becomes a hammer, I don't have to waste any word balloons going, holy cow, I've got amazing power. I can, I can call down thunder. I can call lightning because you know it by looking at him. And in Wonder Woman's case, when her powers are restored, I've forgotten how I did that now, but in the last issue, her power defeats the enemy, her powers are restored. And when that happens in a split second, 
her hair is back to what it was before she cut it. And it wasn't really because she had magical hair growth that suddenly blew it out, but it's because it's the visual cue that her powers have returned. It's kind of a reverse Samson, I guess you could say. So that's one of the things you do in comics. So with Superman, who knew? Um, oh, God, they're all they're all struck dumb. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I don't even um, remember anymore. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think um, it answered it very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any more, uh, Matt? All right, you got it. Okay. Um, this might be a little bit of a of a, of a niche question, um, but I've recently been reading through um, mid '80s Spider-Man, and I came across this really fascinating story where Alistair Smythe mistakes MJ uh, is, becomes convinced that Mary Jane is Spider-Man. I was wondering if you, uh, Weezy, remember writing that story and what your thoughts are on it. Um, if some I, of the, I, I wrote that story? You, you wrote that story. Yeah, you created <laughs> Alistair Smythe. And it's- I have no <laughs> idea. I have no memory of this at all. <laughs> but this, this happens. I mean, this was, how many years ago was this? I, I haven't read the Spider-Man books in a long time. It was like 85 or 86. How many Spider-Man yeah. books did you do, Sugar? I, I think I did I did three issues of Web of Spider-Man oh, and maybe a couple three. issues of some some other Spider-Man crossover. I don't know, some other, what, some other Spider-Man book that was a Spider-Man book before it was a team up or something before Spider-Man. I can't remember now. Right. I think I probably did five or six issues altogether. Sorry. <laughs> well, what do you what do you think about writing Spider-Man in general and specifically uh, Mary Jane Watson because I, I really like the way you wrote her oh um, good I'm glad yeah. I guess I, I I don't remember how I wrote Mary I must have enjoyed it I, I guess I liked Mary Jane because I must have done it I did a good job with her thank heavens for that um sure. yeah I she maybe I should go back and read the Spider-Man books and just see I have I have no idea I'm I'm ashamed to say not a clue. I can vaguely remember some of the story, but only very vaguely. I, I it was a bit of a shot in the dark because it was like an annual 19 or something. So I figured it was like a one off oh, job that you had. Oh, that annual thing. Oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I think Mary, was that one Mary Wilshire drew? Uh, maybe? maybe I don't remember. Maybe. Who knows? I know I can't remember either. <laughs> Well, thank you. But I did, I loved doing Spider-Man. Spider-Man was maybe my, in some ways, my favorite, you know, like mainstream Marvel character. Yeah. I love that he was so competent, more or less anyway, as a hero and his, and his life just kept falling apart. You know, he tried to do this good as, as Spider-Man and then, you know, Mary, Aunt May over here is dying. And, you know, it's like, I, I just, I sort of love the dichotomy of him having this, you know, a, a, a sort of a beneficial existence as a superhero and a kind of a sad life as a, as a regular human being. Yeah. So that was, so I don't know, I just, I just enjoyed him. Fantastic. I was Thank really, so I was really thrilled to be able to write him as much as I did, which I, of course, don't remember. Any other. It really, it really came through in the issue. Oh, good. I'm so glad. You had a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm pleased. Okay. Um. Yeah. All right. So, does anyone have any other questions before I like do my last like two closing questions for the whole thing? Anyone? We're here. Grab us now while we're still. Hey, listen, there. I'm gonna do the opportunity to have them while they're here. So. <laughs> we, 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 we're friendly. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> okay, go ahead. I will say this. This reminds me of one of my favorite bits. Do you guys know who uh, Jeffrey Jeff Darrow is? Darrow. Okay, Jeff Darrow is. Uh, he was one of the principal designers for the Matrix. Mm. Uh, the those those robot octopuses and stuff like that. That's all Jeff. He does his own comic called Shaolin Cowboy. He's a spectacular artist. Um, not all that well known, I don't think, in comics exactly. Although he did a thing, he's done several things with Frank uh, Miller. Um, and they did a thing called uh, what was Rusty the Boy, the big guy and Rusty the Boy robot. They got tuned to cartoons for a while in the afternoon. Um, he did a uh, hard boiled that was a pretty violent uh, hard boiled story that ran for three issues in these large, wide comics. Um, 
but phenomenal. And I, I used to teach the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I oh. that, really. um, and when I was teaching, I would try to have, if I could, I'd get friends of mine who lived in the city to come by and talk to my classes. It would save me having to figure something out for that day. And also it was just, it was fun to have these guys come in. They enjoyed it. Everybody enjoyed it. And I had several of them. Mike Mignola came by a couple of times when he still lived in town. This is a long time ago now. Trish Mulvihill, who's a colorist, came by. And one day I had a couple of guys come by. It was like my, I think maybe the first class. And the problem with the first class is you don't know the students and they don't know you. They know you by reputation maybe, but they don't really know who you are much. And you haven't really established your rapport with them. But these two guys were available right then. And it wasn't like they could come back next week or down the road six weeks or whatever. And they came in and, you know, we asked if anybody had any questions and nobody really had any. And I just, it made me laugh. They talked, they were fine, but it made me laugh because it was Jeff Darrow and Frank Miller. And I thought, what are your chances of ever seeing these guys again in your life? And you could, you know, they're right here. Anything you want to know. And they, nothing really came out. They did talk. It was very nice. It was nice to have them come by. But I did crack really, me. They, well, they were really fun. shy at that point. It is. It's hard to spit stuff out, so especially people you don't know very well. Um, I mean, later classes. That's why I don't know how it works with virtual classes. If you get to know your classmates, I mean, some of you'd already know, but is that a problem? Do you not, is it not the same kind of rapport if it's a new professor or a different bunch of classmates? Is that hard? Look, it's all silence. <laughs> Apparently it is, honey. <laughs> all right, fire up your question. Um, I'm through grilling you guys. <laughs> all right, so I have one for Wheezy, one for you. But um, So Wheezy, one like, like just, this is just for me. Um, I am a huge fan of your steel run. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I like steel. Yeah, um, so yeah, so essentially you do the death of Superman. Then after that, the reign of Superman happened, and then all these crazy Superman characters just come out of nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially, the one you make, you create is the one that doesn't really claim to be Superman and wears this cool suit, and right. is also revealed to be like a, a, an African American. And so, I want to know what your inspiration behind Steel is, because this was around the time like Milestone was happening and all the other cool stuff. So, yeah, I, I really liked the Milestone guys. They did some really yeah, good got, comic books. I got some, I got some Yay! Static was the best. Um, yes. <laughs> so, you know, I, when, okay, you, you, you're thinking, you're trying to think of characters to be Superman mm -hmm. and you think of Man of Steel and then you think of Steel and then the Steel driving man is John Henry and John Henry Irons. So that's, I mean, that's the transition. Uh, I guess, you know, it, it's just, it just sort of made sense to us. And it also turned out that John Henry was one of John Bogdanov, who was my artist's favorite heroes in the whole world. So we said, all right, we got it and, and suggested it. And uh, they said, cool, go ahead. Um, you know, we, we wanted to make him the soul of Superman, like the, the yeah. guy who really felt like, you know, given Superman's powers, he would have been Clark Kent, only, you know, himself. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the, um, that was why we did him. Gotcha. And I, that was one of John's best costumes. That was just a big... Yeah, he, John did a really nice job of designing him. Gotcha. Well, yeah, thank you so much for creating him because I remember as a kid, um, I liked the Superman character, but couldn't really relate to him because he didn't really look like me until one day I pick up a Steel comic and it's a Superman that looks like me. And I'm just like, oh yeah. my God, like... All right. What, what, is it even possible? So yeah. <laughs> thank how you. Old, how old were you? I was around maybe like six or seven years old Yay. when that happened. It was a, a comic that I got at a store once. I don't really remember, but yeah, it was a, a good memory in my in my heart. So thank you, Luis, for creating that character. Oh, it was my pleasure. I really liked him. He was, he was, you know, some of the characters you just sort of like spending time with. Mm -hmm. And John Henry was one of the characters that, that, that I think John and I both really liked spending time with. Gotcha. And so my last question for Walt is, um, I'm also a really big Beta Ray Bill fan. <laughs> um, I think it's like I'm not really that much of a Thor guy, but like Beta Ray Bill is one of the things that's one of the coolest characters in comics. So I just wanted to know, like, what was your inspiration for creating that character? And did you think he would be as popular as you think you thought he was, like, when creating him? 
No, I thought he just vanished down the road like most characters do. <laughs> I mean, again, I've said, we said before, you know, catching lightning in a bottle, you just never know. Um, as far as Bill was concerned, I'll tell, you, I, I'll tell you the story in a second, but I will also say, if you're on Facebook, I have a page called the official Walter Simonson page. And it's one of those, it's a rated Facebook page. If you like it, you can see the content. I have a personal page where I, I only, there you have to get friended, although I think you can follow it. And that one, I reserve for people I actually know, but I started the other page. So people who don't know me, fans can do it. Now you can follow pages, probably wouldn't make any difference. I run them more or less as mirror sites. But, uh, and on that, there are, in those pages, there are no, something called notes up in the little the menus across the top. If you click on notes, I occasionally write little essays on stuff that I, once in a blue moon, not so many recently, on just stuff that I, that interests me. Like, I don't know, five or six years ago, Tropicana Orange Juice did a whole redesign of their packaging. Yeah. And it, to me, it made Tropicana Orange Juice cartons invisible. It was an interesting kind of art school design that I might have done in art school, but it was really impossible. <laughs> I, mean, I walked into the supermarket one day and I went, oh, we get used to get, well, we still get Tropicana occasionally. And I was looking for one of the, the uh, half quart, uh, half gallon sizes, and I couldn't find it. I thought, well, crap, they're not carrying Tropicana orange juice anymore. There's other orange juice, I'll, I'll survive. But I thought, how weird. And then, no, I realized this big section in the middle of the orange juice, it's like three feet, four feet across and back to the back of the shelf. It's all Tropicana orange juice. And your eye just slides right off it because of the new design. And I understood the design, but it was just, you know, they'd gotten rid of the orange. You know, they had that orange with a straw stuck in it as their symbol. They'd gotten rid of that. And I thought, I mean, I understand I want to be more sophisticated, but nothing says fresh orange juice like an orange with a straw stuck in it. It just doesn't. What are you guys thinking? So I, I wrote an essay about design and what that, how that design I thought was a failure. And, and in fact, I was not alone because within three or three months, they went back to their old design. I guess nobody else could find the, the cartons either. So in that other bunch of notes and the ones I've written, one of them is a more or less detailed explanation for the origin of beta ray bill. So if you want to get more information, yeah. go there, like the page, go find it. It'll tell you more than you want to know. But the short version is, I mentioned earlier that comics back then were like monthly magical fruit that appeared on the spinner rack once a month and then disappeared. And the result is that uh, in that shortcut to meaning, I also spoke about um, one of the things that usually happens is that good guys are handsome and bad guys are ugly. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the way it works. It doesn't work as much now, but it did in the old days. And uh, so when I started Thor and I was given Thor to do, I'd only written about 10 stories at that point. I was a brand new writer. In, I mean, I'd been doing comics for 10 years by then, 12, 11 years. And I worked with guys like Archie Goodwin. Um, oh, I should have mentioned Carl Barks was an old influence. We talked about Uncle Scrooge earlier. Carl Barks was a huge influence on what I do as well. I loved his comics as a kid. And uh, so in thinking about it, what I wanted to do, at that time, Thor had come out for 20 years. Now it's been out longer. It's longer now since I did my Thors than it was from the time Thor was created. But at the time, it was 20 years. And what you would like to do, ideally, is a story somebody hasn't read before. I realize that puts me in a very old fashioned group because nowadays half the movies coming out are remakes of old films. I think really, this, they're gonna remake this, they're gonna remake The Wild Bunch, really? So, uh, you know, that's just the way I try to do it. And I wanted to do stories that nobody read and I thought about Thor. And eventually I thought, you know, no one's really picked up the hammer. The hammer has that inscription on it that says, whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And that's never been tested. Mm -hmm. uh, once in one of the Lee Kirby comics, Loki picked it up because he had some extra juice from the Norn Queen. But really, I chose to ignore that story. That was just a lie. That was a hoax, as you might hear these days. So I decided to, I, I thought that since it's been 20 years and no one's picked up the hammer, that means nobody can. I realized that, you know, Captain America hasn't tried. Always has, the Hulk did try, couldn't do it. 
but I just figured that much time, nobody can pick it up. So it's not like I'm going to go back and find a character in the Marvel universe and suddenly go, you, you're picking up the hammer. So I was going to invent them from the ground up. That also played to the idea of doing something nobody had read before in the comic. Mm -hmm. And I decided that he should look like a monster because that way people will read the comic. I hope, I mean, you never know how this is going to work out. They read the comic and go, Oh my God, Simonson's totally fucking up the book. I, you know, this is <laughs> completely screwed the pooch on this. And, uh, um, what I wanted, so I, I made him into a monster and think, I was thinking, thinking about monsters, trying to figure out how to design them. Uh, and as my, my former geology, slightly paleo background was back there, there was a museum in the college that I had I'd gone to. Uh, I went to Amherst College in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and there was a museum there. And one of the things that they had was a, a whole series of like five or six skeletons of horse evolution from Heracotherium, little guy used to call it Eohippus, up to the more modern ones. And then they had a modern horse skeleton in the middle of this kind of square display with an opening at one end. So I'd seen that a lot. I didn't go back and find a horse skeleton. I didn't go find a picture of it. But I decided to use the skull of a horse as kind of the basis for an imaginative basis for the character. Um, and that's why he's got that big gap behind his yeah. teeth. Now, if a lot of people have drawn him since then, draw it like a regular jaw with these teeth up in front, little open. But really, no, no, it's a round. I have no idea how it works. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, it's comic books. So I don't have to design it. Exactly. It's this round thing with these teeth in the front, the way horse, I don't have back teeth the way horses do. I didn't do a whole skull. And that's the, that and the length of it's kind of what I took from a horse skull. Um, until I said somewhere it was based on a horse skull, nobody referred to Bill as a horse-faced alien. I've had a couple of people since then say, oh, I knew it. I knew that's what it was. And I went, no, you didn't, you lying scum. <laughs> basically, uh, once the word was out, now whenever he's referred to, it's always, oh, that horse face alien. And it mm -hmm. makes me disinclined to reveal my inspirations and in future creations. But in any case, the skull is a wonderful symbol for death. Usually when you see it, let me just reach across here. Nice. I'm doing a character right now whose head is largely skull minus a lower jaw. So I have a couple of life-size skulls, plastic ones, up on my drawing board right now. And but the skull represents death. At the same time, it's the structure Hello? for a great deal of beauty. Hi. It's, it's where beautiful stuff comes from. Hi. What's that? No. So, so no. in drawing the, in using the skull, in some degree, I hope to reveal both the monster in this character and the antithesis of that, the beauty of the character as well, because mm -hmm. the skulls are what make beauty possible. Mm -hmm. So that's why I chose that. Um, I gave him the Thor costume, a variant of it. So when it happens, we know exactly when he gets his powers, you know exactly what has happened without my explaining it. I gave him a background where he was tortured and sawn apart and put together whatever happened to him because he had to be worthy of the hammer, whatever that means. I, I'll grant you worthy is a slippery word that can mean lots of things, lots of people. Uh, I will say I did do it with the knowing that once you let the genie out of the bottle, there's no putting it back in. Exactly. And, and so now everybody and his brother has picked up the hammer, but that's really the fault of the editor in chief and the writers and the editors at Marvel Comics. That's got nothing to do with me. You can't do stories in a collaborative creation like American comics, mainstream American comics, and have an idea and think, oh, I can't do this because somebody else down the road is going to screw it up. You just can't. You can't censor yourself like that. If you find good ideas, you have to do them. So I did it. Um, one of my thoughts about worthiness, whatever that means, is that it means that you have to be a warrior and you have to be willing to kill the enemy. Mm. A, it's kind of a Viking yeah. virtue. <laughs> and even though Thor doesn't go around killing too many guys or people, enemies, but the possibility is there. So it's one of the reasons I think several of the folks who've lifted the hammer in later storylines wouldn't really be able to lift it. 
Now I know that other writers disagree with me, but I invented the trope. So I get to say how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it works for me. It works because right. Bill was capable of, as a, a warrior guardian of his people. He was capable of dealing death when he had to. Wonder Woman might be able to lift it. She has lifted it in the comics. Yeah. She's almost the only other character in comics that I would agree with. Um, for very, partly because of her god, goddess or semi-goddess, demigod status. I'm not quite sure what she is. But she is a warrior. Um, I don't know if she actually goes out and kills in battle. I don't know enough about the Wonder Woman books that have been done, honestly. But it seems to me that would not be an, uh, an un, I don't know, unviewable situation for the character. So she might be able to do it. Most of the rest of them, the ones I've seen, not really. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, you put the ideas out there, you don't get to control them in the mainstream comic. But that's really, that was why I did the stuff I did with a hammer. That's why I gave, I gave Bill his own hammer. Um, I occasionally get asked, well, is he stronger than Thor? Because now he has his own power, you know, his own strength and mm -hmm. the power of Thor. And the answer is, I have no friggin' idea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really care. That stuff, if I have to do a story, a lot of these, a lot of the things like this, you learn when you write the story. It's not so much the knowledge you have that a priori, yes, this guy can pick up this weight or whatever it's going to be. I want a story where I'm going to have to figure out how that's going to work. And that's really how that is. That's, so that's, that kind of stuff to me is how that works. But Bill, Bill worked out really well. I was very, I mean, he wasn't that popular for a long time. You know, he appeared, I did him a couple of times in my book, maybe mm -hmm. three times. Um, and he showed up in things like the Thor Corps. Yeah. But, but I got nothing to do with that either. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, I, I don't know what Jack thinks about the way I did Thor. Mm -hmm. You know, he helped to create him, major force in creating him. And he gets to watch all, you know, clowns like me working over his characters. I don't know how that would be. So at least, well, I know how it would be because I had it done myself, but I wouldn't know it to the extent Jack did since Jack helped create so many characters. Yeah. But, but really, that's where Bill came from. Um, oh, and the name, the other thing I'll say is the name. What I wanted was, you know, that good old Marvel alliteration, which Stan yeah. Lee was a great proponent of. And I wanted something that sounded vaguely science fiction -y. Um, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, gamma rays were already taken. Yeah. I was like the Hulk. I can't really do that. And, and alpha rays, the two things about them, you know, one, it's just what a helium nucleus. And it's also a, it's not very alliterative, mm -hmm. you know, appa alpha, you know, eh, maybe not, maybe that's not the name I want to go with. So the B is a harder sound. I mean, beta rays are only, I think, loose electrons. So eh, there's not much going on there. But the B was a good sound. And for, so I said beta rays. And for a last name, a third name, I wanted a name that was a common name. Because in a sense, Bill is every man to his people. Now he's not common, he's anything but common to his people as, as their warrior. But he is, he was an every man. So, you know, I wasn't gonna call him the, the most common name I think in America is Johnson, at least it used to be. And I could have used Smith. I thought about beta ray Jones. But the trouble with Jones was there's an Indiana Jones. There's, there was a Louise Jones working at Marvel at the time. <laughs> there was Rick Jones over in the Hulk. Mm -hmm. And they were doing the Indiana Jones comic for about 20 seconds at Marvel. And said, too many Joneses, I'm not going there. So eventually I settled on the first name for Bill, as in William, which is a common Anglo-Saxon name or whatever it comes from England, I presume. Could be French, actually. But it's a common enough first name, at least in my generation. And, and I like the alliteration. So it, wasn't, it was not going to be Beta Ray William. <laughs> so it was Beta Ray Bill. That gave me the, the alliteration I wanted. And my feeling is, given the fact that Bill has no lips, and I don't have any idea how he talks, mm -hmm. um, I suspect that Beta Ray Bill, those Bs are hard to say. So... I used to read a lot of science fiction, not so much anymore, but I did read a lot of it when I was younger. And, you know, in pulp science, in crappy pulp science fiction, when you're, or in movies, the crappy movies, when you arrive on the alien planet, you get your little metal translator here in your belt and you flip it on and the guy goes, and you say, hi, how you doing? You look good for dinner. You know, whatever the alien says, you know, it comes out of your box 
and you yeah. go back in and you say it, and that's the way it works out. So my feeling is that whatever Bill's real name is, Beta Ray Bill is the sound your box makes when it comes out from whatever. doesn't mean anything. It's just the words as your translator puts it together, your universal translator. So I have no idea what Bill's real name is. Okay. But, but that was, that's really where Bill came from. And that's, I thought a lot about the character. I put a lot of work into creating the, probably as much as I've done any character I've done, because I knew what I wanted it to do. And I knew I wanted it to, you know, to work in the book. And, and for the most part, I did. There are people out there who don't like Beta Ray Bill. I can live with that. But Peter's there are plenty of people who liked him as a character and that was okay. Yeah, well, he's a great character. I, I love Beta Ray Bill so much. I see one more question from the top. Or is that what that is? Yeah, just one more. I'm just going to have the, sorry, Mike, I'm going to have the closing question. Oh, yeah, of course. I just want to have uh, just a final question and Mike, you can uh, wrap up. But I wanted to ask, there's about five art majors in here. That right was actually now. my, I was going to, I, I was know, thinking about this well, question. Well, I took it from you. There's, <laughs> like, there's five art majors in this panel right now. And I know that you've been mentioning art school. And I just wanted to know, like, if you liked art school and if you have any advice for us artists out there. Or writers. Matt's a writer. So. Matt's a writer. But I'm more asking for the artist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this is the writer. I'm artist right the, now. The, the writer part's really short in that I, I never really considered myself a writer. I got into comics to draw. I kind of fell into the writing. It's worked out for me. But it, as Larry Hama says, been faking it all my life. And Larry has written a bunch of great comics. Yes. So I think that's what I've been doing too, as far as the writing goes. Been faking it all my life. I don't have, you know, you you learn, it's like everything else. You learn to write by doing it. John D. McDonald, who was a very good writer, uh, died a little too young, I'm afraid, but he wrote a lot of original paperback originals in the 50s and 60s that were great. And his view of that was that everybody has, I don't remember the number, it won't really matter. Everybody has 50 really crappy novels in them. So if you want to be a writer, you better start writing now so you can get those 50 <laughs> novels out of your system and get to the good stuff. So that's the writing end of it. On the art stuff, um, you know, I wouldn't presume to suggest that my experience would be applicable for anybody else. I just don't know. Um, mm -hmm. In my case, I mentioned earlier, I had not liked art courses I'd taken. I took, I mean, and this is what, this goes back to like seventh, eighth and ninth grades. We had to take art courses and I, you know, I got B's in art courses because I just didn't work that hard. I, because I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. One year I had an eighth grade, had a, a teacher, Mrs. Miss or Mrs. Mrs. I think Pope and Mrs. Pope realized I wanted to draw. So she taught me one point, two point and three point perspective. That was my introduction. And I was wowed by it and I was good at it. And that was the only year I got an A in art because she kind of graded me what I did rather than what I did for the crappy stuff that I didn't have to do. Um, I took a couple of courses when I was at Amherst. Eh, you know, I wasn't bad at it. I think I passed okay, but somehow just didn't thrill me. When I went to art school, I really went out of desperation. In a way, I wasn't sitting there sweating, but um, I graduated in 68 uh, as a geology major. And for those of you who are too young to remember, which is everybody in this room, uh, 68 was essentially the height of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And largely, if you were getting out of college in 67, 68, or 69, you were being drafted. You're drafted. Unless you had some kind of deferment, going to grad school, going to med school, other stuff. And I decided not to go to grad school, knowing what it meant. Uh, but I didn't, so I didn't make any plans for the future. I said, well, I'm going to get drafted. We'll see what happens. And I was drafted at the end of the summer, September of 68. And I took, I went to the draft board, got in the bus, was taken to Baltimore, went to Fort Holabird, no longer there. Took my physicals, took my mental tests, you know, the writing tests. And at the end of the day, the doctor looked over my paperwork. There were several doctors, little cubicles and said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to fail you, son, because of your eyes. I'm really, I'm legally blind. I'm very, very, very nearsighted. Mm -hmm. And probably not the guy you want to give a loaded rifle to and drop it in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> I didn't question him. I just said, I just thanked him. Uh, and suddenly I had a future open up in front of me again. Um, it, was a, it was not a great time to be 21 years old. 
I had friends who went to Vietnam, one friend who was killed over there, other friends who came back and were different, and some friends who went to Canada. It was just, it was a bad time. So I, whatever you did, I'll play with it. But then I had to start figuring out what the heck to do. So I moved back home, lived with my parents for a little while longer, my poor parents, and uh, worked in a bookstore and applied to art schools because the only other thing I did besides, or like besides dinosaurs and paleo was drawing. So I got in at RISD. I went there, they took me as a transfer student, even though I had a degree already. Went there as a transfer student. The way that worked at RISD was you went in in the summer for a six week course or six weeks of training, which is essentially freshman year in six weeks. So it was like five or six courses. There's a lettering course, a drawing, a 2D drawing, maybe 3D, 3D work of some kind, uh, a nature drawing course, a figure drawing course. That's five. I may be missing one or I may not. And if you pass that, you matriculated in the fall as a sophomore, which is what I did. So I went there really because I didn't know what else to do. It wasn't like I was gung ho. I, I didn't have any uh, ambition to pursue an art course in comic books. I didn't think about doing comics at the time. I hadn't thought about it. But I had read Marvel comics as a madman all through the late, mid to late 60s. By the end of the 60s, I'd kind of read all of Marvel stories. They were re beginning to repeat themselves. I wasn't so interested. But DC started doing really interesting stuff. Most of their books didn't last that long. But like Enemy Ace by Joe Kubert, just a great comic book. Yeah. Angel and the Ape was pretty goofy. There were, there were Steve Vitko did The Creeper. There were some yeah. cool books coming out of there. So I was reading some of those. And uh, so while I was at RISD, I found things that I liked. And I was able to enlarge my knowledge, really, in a way that I, I don't know that I expected to. I'm not sure what I expected, really. As I said, I was awful at painting. So much of what you're going to get from art school, <coughs> excuse me, depends on your teachers. Depends enormously on your teachers. A good teacher can make something that would normally be a boring subject interesting. And a bad teacher can ruin a good one. So I'll keep my fingers crossed for all of you that you'll have good teachers. I had a handful. I didn't have any really awful teachers, but I had some like my painting instructor who didn't do much instructing and I wasn't smart enough about painting to be able to figure it out. Because of silkscreen, I might've figured it out later. But I've never become a painter, never been a color guy. So I've never learned that stuff. Uh, I finally start getting into secondary colors and tertiary colors and stuff. My brain starts to dissolve. So it doesn't help me a whole lot. But I took like my, my silk screening course was incredibly valuable to me. Um, one of the things I found, I don't know if you guys will have this opportunity, uh, in the silk screening course, I became the assistant for the professor senior year. That was great, partly because you see all these other mistakes you haven't made yourself yet. And you have to figure out, figure them out. First thing, one of the first things that happened, I had a young woman, young girl who was doing, we were doing three color, a three color print. And you had to lay the colors or transparent inks. So you had to have the color by itself and then in two, combination of two and then a combination of three. Any, well, it didn't matter what the drawing was or print, abstract, whatever you wanted to do. She was doing it, working on it and she called me over. Her screen was clogging up. And we had big sinks and you know, slop sinks and all sorts of stuff and more paint thinner. It's amazing I'm still alive. I can't imagine what that stuff was doing in my system from all the stuff we slopped around back then. But so I cleaned the screen. I'm trying to get it out. I can't get it out. And I'm just, and art wasn't there. The teacher wasn't there right then. I thought, oh no, I'm doomed. This is my first real problem. I have no idea what's going on. I can't imagine what's happening. And I'm trying to do this, trying to do that. And finally, I said, well, let me see your inks. And the inks essentially were uh, tubes of oil paint. You, must, you bought regular oil paint. You put some stuff called extender in it, which just stretched it out. And, it would, and you'd print in oil, basically. I looked at the tubes of paint and they were acrylic paint. <laughs> Thank you, whoever you are at the bottom, because that's exactly right. 
the, the, oh. Oh, God. the paint had begun to dry instantly in herself in the screen. Wow, and that's bad. Then, it's just a layer of plastic inside the webbing of the screen, weave oh. of the screen. Oh. And there's nothing you can do. Kiss that screen goodbye. Kiss that screen. We'd all made our own screens. They had they had silk at the art shop, the student art shop, and they had boards that were the right size. So you hammer together your own frame and you stretch the silk. You had they did have stretchers. You stretch the silk and you staple them all in and you put tape over all of them, water, water-based tape over everything and shellacked everything. So it was a bit of work to create them. I did several. And uh, she was her first job was going to be creating a new screen and buying oil paint. So you learn stuff that way that you would not have learned. I don't know if I would ever have used oil paint, but I mean acrylic paint, but I sure as hell wouldn't have after that. And and you learn a great deal just in the teaching to the, the folks in your class. It's great. Um, as far as you know, teachers, um, I had I had the good fortune to run into a handful of good ones. I had one, the summer course I took in lettering uh, was a guy that was normally a drawing teacher. They, they would switch, teachers would switch around disciplines for the summer courses. And I learned about lettering and I learned about kerning, about spacing lettering out. And one of the things that we had to do was we had to construct Roman letters about so high, mm -hmm. six, eight inches, pick a word, four or five letters, draft out the lettering. So I discovered, for example, we, we were using Roman letters. There was a guy who'd written a book about Roman letters based on the Roman lettering in the Trajan column over in, I guess it's in Rome. And he had worked out the mathematics for how they all worked. And I discovered, I learned, for example, that the O, the axis of the O is vertical. But the axis of the negative space inside the O mm -hmm. is off by four degrees. Now I'm saying these figures, I'm hoping I have them remembering it correctly. It's an oval and you can construct the oval using compasses and rulers and measurements. You can do, that's how you construct them. But all the letters have things like that in them. So the ascenders on an N, they're not just straight lines. They're very almost imperceptible arcs because if you in, in concave, I guess, going into the center of the letter, because if you into the uh, ascender, because if you make them straight, they don't have any life. And all these things, if you do the uh, uh, serif across the top, the serif isn't a straight line. It's actually slightly bowed down and back out, but very slightly. And all those things give this very formal lettering a life, a visible life in the letters. So they don't lie there dead on the page. I lettered the word groan because I just read Mervyn Peake's Gorman Gas Trilogy, which came out of paperback just after The Lord of the Rings. It is a completely different book. It's really cool. It's very strange, but it's very neat. And the family name is Groan. Titus Groan is one of the characters, major character. And so I lettered the word Groan out. And I did great, except that I screwed up the kerning on the end, and it's too far off. Mm. Right. I could have killed myself. I didn't, but I felt like it. I think so. I saw the lettering. I think I took it a while back. I scanned it and I moved the end in its right place, damn it, because it's annoyed me for <laughs> computers. 50 years. <laughs> so uh, he was a good teacher. I never had him again, never had him for drawing. Uh, never really saw him again, but I, it was an incredibly valuable course uh, about the art of making letters. Um, and the silkscreen course was great. I did lithography. I sucked at lithography, um, but the lithography we did was on actual limestone slabs. Do you guys do lithography in art at all? I'm not done it yet. Yeah, we've done it. It's super cool. <laughs> okay, and it was yeah, we had these big, we had these big heavy slabs of limestone. You you grind them around to flatten them out, and then you draw on the rock. And uh, you know, I I did all my prints in the last twenty minutes. I didn't do them over the semester like I should have. And so I was cranking out these prints and running the hand presses and doing a, inking things up with a roller, everything. And, uh, but I did learn and I got, I, I passed okay in the course. I, I never told the guy what I did, but uh, what I did learn drawing on rock was a love of texture. Hmm. You can just go 
into the rocks, <laughs> razor blades, you use whatever, you know, I'm going, I'm drawing on a rock, it's not gonna matter. So <laughs> even though I didn't get a great grade in the course, I learned something from it. I learned the love of something from it. So that was what art school did for me. It, I, it also, again, I don't know how applicable this would be to you guys. Um, when I was doing my comic, uh, I did the Star Slammers. I had started as a junior project. Uh, Tom Seguros, who died a few years ago, Tom was the head of the department, taught juniors. And you had a project every, every week, a new project, every, some was a two week project. This was illustration in the junior year. And you also, he wanted to do an overarching project that would run all two semesters. So I did the short project and I began the Star Slammers as my overarching project. I got Tom's permission to do it. I explained what I wanted to do. I was obviously quite serious about it. Um, and he was game to have me try it, which was great. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody had come through RISD at that point who had ever done a comic book or a comic of some kind. Mm -hmm. So I got half of it done saw, uh, fra uh, junior year. And then I had another teacher senior year who was quite interesting, not as good a teacher, but Edgar, was happy to have me keep doing a comic. So I finished the comic off my senior year. I wrapped it up right at the end of the senior year. So it became my portfolio. I could take it to New York and show it to people. I'd gotten good enough. So uh, mm -hmm. it had shown, it, it gave me, I, I, it was all black and white. It was written, penciled, lettered and inked by me. And then eventually bound up into a book. So, uh, but one of the things I found my free senior year Edgar was not, he just said, hey, man, whatever's cool. It's all right. You know, he was like an old guy and he was just, yeah, it was, he was fine. But uh, I didn't learn a lot from him. Except I, got, I got all these great stories about life in New York and the art world and the art game. That was what he was good for. And I was the last, I was the last student on Friday to see him because of all individual sessions. So I got all these fabulous stories, but not a lot on the drawing. So every so often I would take my new work I would get down to Tom Segura's office and if he was in and he had a minute, he'd see me out there. He'd wave me on in. I'd go in and show him my stuff. And the thing I, one of the things I, the thing I remember most, I had a big head I had drawn on the full size, you know, it was like almost life size. And at the time I had only really begun to understand the value of reference. A lot of people who see comics think, oh, these guys just knock it out. They don't know what people do. <laughs> Some people do, but comics, the draftsmanship's a lot more sophisticated now than it was 50 years ago. So I showed this to Tom. He looks, he goes, well, you know, you're not really getting the eyes. And then he proceeds to grab up some paper and draw a cross section of an eye, showing me the roundness of the ball, the thickness of the lid above and below, the brow, all this stuff, which I had kind of faked in my drawing. So I took the drawings back. Back then we used a lot of rubber cement. Now it's all digital, I presume. But uh, and I, rubber cement destroys paper. You don't want to be using it. Mm. But I redrew the eyes and I pasted them in over the existing eyes and they were way better, way better. So I learned the value of reference from working on that strip. Uh, Tom was a big help to me all the way through. Became a good friend after I was out of RISD. Um, so I don't know what to tell you about the, you know, art school was valuable for me. I made some good friends there, although honestly, I don't know I've kept in touch with any of them. Since I graduated <laughs> from there. Um, you know, I've got two guys from high school I trade Christmas cards with. Uh, several guys from Amherst. We were, uh, the floor I was on my freshman year, we really bonded. It was a very, at the time, Amherst was reputed to have the toughest freshman curriculum in the country. Mm. I don't know if that was true, but it was tough. And it, so we bonded. So a lot of those guys I'm still in touch with. Uh, RISD, not so much. There's a, one guy I would love to be in touch with. We lost track a number of years ago and haven't been able to find him. So, you know, that's kind of the way it works. But, and also uh, not a lot of guys at RISD went to comics. A few did. David Mazzucchelli went to RISD mm. and the guy who did, there's a newspaper strip called Foxtrot, which isn't being done. Bill Amond or Amond was an Amherst graduate. 
and I think the guy that did Get Fuzzy, this weird strip about a cat, Dabney Coleman, I think, or whatever his name is. I think he was an Amish grad. So there are a few people here and there. Rizzi, I'm not so sure. Maybe they, there may be more, more, more strip guys from Amherst than there were from RISD. Um, but I did learn in the three years I was at RISD, I learned a lot. Um, again, mostly from the better teachers, but some stuff, even the teachers that weren't as good. Uh, so it was very valuable to me. And also in putting my portfolio together, again, I, you know, you look backwards, it all looks really as if it were all planned. And really it's not. When you're in the middle of it, like you guys are, you don't see the future. You just kind of know where you've come from, but you're not really sure how it's going to work out. So in my case, doing my portfolio at RISD, you have the time. I didn't have to have a, well, I worked in the refectory, the cafeteria there. So I paid for my meals. I didn't have a separate job. And uh, I was able to work on a portfolio at a time when I didn't have a very high over, I didn't have a high overhead. I didn't have a lot of other stuff to do besides classes, of course. And so when I graduated, I had a portfolio. I could actually go show people as opposed to having to work a portfolio out once I was out in the real world. It is difficult in comics anyway. I don't know about anywhere else, but in comics, it's very difficult to be in the real world, have a job, and try to go home at night and work on your comic book. It's exhausting. Because, and even you guys have a lot more energy than we do, but it's just, it's really tiring to do that. So if you're able to use this time to put together a portfolio, not, a, I mean, if you know what you want to do, one of my, one of my friends at RISD was an intaglio printer and he produced a portfolio of abstract intaglio prints that were pretty small. And he is now a chiropractor. <laughs> not, not a lot of call for intaglio printmakers of small prints. I'm not saying you couldn't find a gallery somewhere to do it, but you might have to work at it. So it was very useful to me without really knowing how comics was going to work out. I just, I did it just as a flyer. I didn't really know anything. I knew now, if you were going to do comics, you've got the web, you've got clubs like this, you've got all kinds of stuff where, hey, sugar. Frozen, then I was gone. Oh, Weezy's computer froze, and then she was gone. Oh, okay. Slide up over here. Oh, sure, why not? <laughs> so, again. And let me let me flip on the overhead lights for a second. And we'll see if they uh, just flip those on. See if that'll make a difference. This is amazing. <laughs> down, yeah, down below. So um, you should you should turn the, the camera around at some point and let people see your studio. Oh, okay, I can do that. I'll do. I'll show you my studio here in a second. Right. So. Um, I don't know, I've got, I haven't got much else. And I don't know if I can <clears throat> ask and tell you more about it. It was well, very useful for me. Them, did you tell them that? Can you see Weezy? Yes. Oh, 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 yeah, okay. um, Hi. <laughs> did you tell them that when you were in Amherst, that your your friends say they can't believe you passed any of your courses because all oh. you ever did was draw? <laughs> yeah, that's, I just <laughs> I just had my 50th reunion a couple of years ago. Okay. And one of them one of them said, yeah, they couldn't believe I passed my courses. All I ever did was draw. <laughs> 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 you know, I don't remember drawing 24 seven, but I drew a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you did a big Spider-Man. Where was that? Well, that was a, senior, a junior year. Um, you know, I, I went and got a, and this is a, I was a geology major. I was not doing art, uh, but I went and got a sheet. I don't know how I even did this. My, my roommates had cars. Uh, we got an eight, eight by four sheet of masonite and I got white paint and I covered, I, I painted white all over it. And this was at the height of my marble fanaticism. And then I drew and then painted in enamel because I could get a hold of those paints, a pretty much a life-size Spider-Man figure. Based on wow. a, based on a Steve Ditko drawing, and he's just swinging on a swinging on his thing. I had one leg, le one leg that was so badly curved, it was like, oh my god, really? I mean, Ditko curved the legs somehow. Yeah, of course, ball, it looked really out of out of whack. And I just did it. I just and we hung it up in the in the. We had I was in a, a social dorm, as they were called. They're gone now, but there was one big room, and then a hallway off it. At the end of the hall was the bathroom, and then there were four small rooms, each bedroom for each guy. You had your your desk and a bed and and then this communal living room bed for everybody. And so we hung it on the wall of the living room. And as it happened, our dormitory 
faced up the hill toward the campus. So if you were coming down from campus to go to the, one of the five social dorms, you saw this giant Spider-Man in our window That's <laughs> on nice. the wall. And then my senior year, I got some more, I got some more, another Pina Mace night and I primed it. And then I painted more door with Orla Druin erupting off in the corner. And I think mm -hmm. maybe I had the dark tower, the better do it off in the distance. And I just, it was all invented mountains. I didn't know anything about what mountains. <laughs> I knew what they looked like. I've been a geology guy, but I just, you know, I didn't go get reference. I just, and I just, you know, with the boldness of youth, and now I'd be too scared to do it. Back then I was like, give me the paint. I'll just, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. I don't know what happened to they. I, one of my roommates took the Mordor painting. Uh, He's, he's gone, so I have no idea what happened to the painting or the Spider-Man painting. I have no idea what happened to it. Um, the shield. We did the shield. Oh, this is what I should have known what I was going to end up doing. So I'm glad Wheezy's here. To, I know. Or you guys are going to go, oh, <laughs> shut up. Jesus. I can't <laughs> believe he's still going. Um, I took a humanity. My freshman year, one of the courses in, in freshman year at Amherst was a humanities course. And mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a reading course. And so we had to read stuff, and then the professor, we would discuss it and write papers and stuff like that. And the first book that we read was the Odyssey. And I forget either the Lattimore or the Fitzgerald translation, I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then we read the Aeneid. Do you guys all know what the Aeneid is? Let me say that over again. Does anyone here not know what the Aeneid is? It's okay if you don't. I just want to I, I don't. I okay. don't. <laughs> all right, no problem. Great, man. No sweat. Uh, that's okay. Nobody else does either, but you're, you're taking the heat for those guys. So it'll be all yeah, right. Yeah, I will. I'll, 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 I'll throw myself yeah. into the fire. What it is, it's an epic poem written during the Roman Empire. And it's a poet's name is Virgil, wrote other things. He was a big admirer of Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so he wrote his own version, in a sense, of the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the basic story is that Aeneas is the son of a king of Troy. And when Troy falls to the Greeks, it's destroyed by the Greeks, he escapes the wreck of Troy. And he sails around the Mediterranean, has a bunch of adventures, the way Odysseus had adventures in the Odyssey, and eventually arrives in Italy, about where Rome is now, I guess. I've forgotten exactly. And he founds, he has a big fight with the Etruscans, I think. Well, I don't remember. Don't tell anybody I said that. And, but he eventually ends up founding what will become the progenitor of Rome. So Virgil was tying Rome into the, Tro the classical Trojans, and mm -hmm. making that the origin of the Roman Empire, which was good for his audience, um, good propaganda. So the poem's really cool. And we ended up reading the translation that our professor had done, because it turns out Rolf Humphreys was a published poet. Uh, he hung out with the literati in, in the New York in the 30s, knew guys like Ezra Pound, uh, got involved in a lot of that stuff. I didn't know any of that until later on. And ultimately, translated a bunch of the Roman poets and the Scribner's library was mo a lot of it was his stuff the, la the Latin work the Virgil and the uh, oh I don't remember the other guys now uh, my brain's blanking out and the other poets sorry but they were there were a bunch of them and they, he wrote a lot of that stuff or translated a lot of it so he read that and in it there's a scene that Virgil kind of lifts from the Odyssey where for whatever reason, I've forgotten why, Aeneas loses his armor and he has to have new armor. And Aeneas is, I'm gonna say his mother is a goddess. So Aeneas is kind of half God, half human. And because of that, the gods, it was the Vulcan, I presume, forges new armor for him. And they make a great shield. And on the shield, he forges the images of the history of Rome from, I don't know what the beginning was, maybe when Romulus and Remus, I don't know how the story of Romulus and Remus fits into this whole thing, but it ends up in the center where the boss would be of, I think, of Octavius who became Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome when they threw out the, uh, pro the councils, proconsuls. He, it's Augustus, it's, or what's the later Augustus, Octavius and his allies driving off the defeating the fleets of Antony and Cleopatra and helping to establish the Roman hegemony around the mm. hegemony, is that hegemony, I think, around the Mediterranean. So I thought that was really cool. 
So without reference, because then my fresh, this was my freshman year, I had no beans about reference. Mm -hmm. I went back and I got a big piece of oak tag and I cut it in a big circular form. I have no idea what Roman shields really looked like in that period. I don't think they were circular. Viking shields were circular. Yeah, they were. But I made it a round form and I drew the shield of Aeneas, probably in pencil and then pen tell. There weren't a lot of felt tip pens back in those days. And so, and I did it by making it a whole spiral that started in a very thin slip on the outside and then got wider and then wound its way around to the center image. And I just made it into little panels. I just cut a little vertical line through each and made little panels all the way through and drew the entire shield. And at some point I was in the class. I might have talked, I don't know if I talked to Ralph after a class one day, I'm not sure what, but the shield came up and I said I had drawn it. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, would you mind bringing it in? I said, well, okay. So I brought in the shield and then he asked me if he could borrow it. And I said, okay. So he took the shield with him. And later he told me that they've been having an argument in the classics department as to whether it was possible to put all this crap onto one shield. Was Virgil writing metaphorically or literally? Hmm. And there were guys on both sides of the argument. And Ralph walked in and threw the shield on the desk at the table, the conference table, and said, the argument's over. <laughs> so wow. one of my first scores in art, I didn't know it at the time. And I gave Ralph the shield. And back in those days, didn't have a camera. None of us had phones, good no goodness, goodness knows. So I have no copy of it. Roth retired at the end of that year, died about five years later. I never saw the shield again, but it lives on green in memory. And it still cracks me up. I was able to solve a, an <laughs> argument about how many Aeneas's can dance in the head of a pin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, I mean, in that sense, I was in college for se seven years, if you count RISD. Um, I learned a lot. A lot of it informed the work that I do. Uh, I don't know what work you guys want to do. I don't know if you know what you want to do. What what grades? Oh, grades is the wrong word. What years are you guys at at, at uh, Penn? Uh, at Penn, I'm I'm a senior. Um, I, think, I think we're all seniors. Yeah, most of like. I'm a sophomore. Oh, yeah, Mo's a sophomore. Yeah, Mo is also a sophomore, but most of us are seniors. All right. Yeah. Well. Good luck at my college. Made it a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't work. I don't know what's going to happen there. But um, but that was what I found about art school. It was, I, you know, again, what I because I only drew with pencil, I mean, mostly a little bit of ink. I did some inking. Um, in the beginning, I only I inked with technical pens. They're called rapidographs. Uh, what they are is a pen like this. I still use them occasionally, where they have a they have a fountain of ink inside here, a little cartridge of ink inside there and a single tip and a, a little, the tip is a single size. So what you get is like a drafting line out of this. You get a single size line. And that's what I used originally when I inked because they were, it felt as much like a pencil as, as anything, as any kind of inking tool. Um, somewhere beyond that, I learned to use croquil pens. We can't hardly see this in this kind of resolution. There it is right there. A uh, crocodile pen, which is a flexible nib, came across them somewhere, started using them, uh, and I've used them ever since. I discovered I discovered them by the time I was at RISD. I was using them to ink the Star Slammers, so I probably found them in the late '60s. So I've been using them a long time, um, and somewhere along the way, I discovered that using a brush, it's the least like using a pencil in its feel, because you can't press on the paper with a brush. You have to be delicate, but because the line is so expressive, it's probably the most like a pencil line in, in transliterating your pencil line into an ink line. You get some of this, it doesn't look the same, but you get some of the same effect, light and dark width, stuff like that you can do with a pencil. So I don't use a brush very often, but I do use it occasionally. Oh, I can show you a drawing I do with a brush actually. Sure. Um, give me a favor, Sugar. Grab the T-Rex that's on top of that. This, it's over there, I'm sorry, beyond the pill bottles there. Should be right there. I'm an old guy, plenty of pills. 
No. <laughs> That's the one. I don't know how much of this you'll be able to see. This is a cover for, yeah, I'll show it in sections maybe. Wow. For yeah. a comic, it's a reprint of a comic from the 60s called Kona Monarch of Monster Isle. And it's kind of a King Kong riff with uh, cavemen and dinosaurs in a lost island and, and Neanderthals with uh, M1s. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> does that really show up? Does that? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can see it. Great. It's, it's amazing. So I finished that yesterday. So, um, you know, my thought, well, Jenna, what we tell, oh, I'm sorry, babe. The, what we get, what we get, what we get asked, we get asked, how do you break into comics? Mm -hmm. And that's probably true for any artistic discipline. Yeah, any artistic discipline. And the answer for us largely is that you have to have a portfolio and you have to have a break. And I've known people, some of my former students, who've gotten breaks, but didn't really have the portfolio. And the portfolio being defined portfolio. It's well, not just a few pages that you've drawn or paintings you've painted, but it's your very best work, the very best that you can Yes, do. yeah, the best stuff. I mean, if you, you know, you don't hear this so much anymore, but in the old days, you do portfolio reviews and mm -hmm. kids come up and they'd say, oh, you know, I know you guys do comics really fast. So I drew these 35 pages in my hotel room last night. And they will look like 35 pages drawn in a guy's hotel room by a guy who can't draw. Mm. And he's not going to get any work out of that. Or you'll have guys say, look, I can draw as well as Joe Schmo, who's like the worst artist getting work in comics. And the deal is no editor is going to hire you so you can replace Joe Schmo. Yeah. If that's the level you're talking about, you're not going anywhere. So you need your best work. In comics, it may take longer, too longer than you would want to take for a regular comic book page. But the idea is to get in first. And if you want to do it, you will figure out some way to get the work done fast. I had a guy recently, I'm on Instagram. I'm not very good at Instagram. It's too hip. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and so I just, I post pictures of pictures I post on Facebook. I post my pictures on Facebook. So I post pictures there. I post pictures on Instagram and on Twitter. Pretty much the same pictures and i'll answer questions people have occasionally i don't like i don't like instagram much because i don't like typing my phone it's like my thumbs are too old to be mm -hmm. typing away on a phone but uh but i have posted pictures i had a guy ask me a question recently where he wanted to know how he could get faster because he had done some comic he had done a comic i guess but he hadn't it was hard meeting a deadline and I don't, I don't have a lot of answer for that. I mean, especially if I haven't seen his work, which I haven't. It's hard to know. Um, one of the things you do in comics, you can toss out all the stuff that isn't necessary to tell the story. Now, there are artists who do a lot of elaborating on their work. I get that. I do my, my work now. I did Thor in 1983, 84, 85. I do Ragnarok now. I do more lines in my work now than I did in 1984. I'm not sure it's better because you more lines in a panel than you did. Yeah, I did, I did in a page back in those days. That's true. I don't know if that's a wise decision or not. So, um, but in his case, starting out, <clears throat> you do have to figure out some way to do that. And and the, the short answer really is a: it's not going to be easy. And b: if you really want to do it, you will figure it out. You will not give up. What I used to, I had three. My class had three things I try to teach my students. Oh, I know what it was in comics. And you guys may not want to do comics, but this, this, this was a comic book class. So the three things were, the first was that every decision you make when you're doing a page, I don't need pages handy, but if I had a page, I'd show you. Every decision you make is about your story. This is for me. I'm an old guy. It should be about your story. And the, the question is, is this decision making my story better, worse, or about the same? Those, that's not always an easy, those aren't always easy questions to answer. 
Are you hunting for a page? I'm looking for a page. Oh, uh, uh, pull, pull that bottom, uh, top drawer out. I was going to say, there's some in the drawer. She actually put yeah, them so probably under a cover. They're going to be some ink. Just pull one well, this out. Is, um, this is just scribbles. You have to look, look below <laughs> that. Yeah, look below that. Yeah, that, that aren't splash pages. Yeah, there's one right there. Any other? I don't know what you can see in it, but. Oh, is that just one? It's two. It's okay. Yeah, it feels um, Yeah, I don't know how much you can see in this. Uh, this is a page from Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. um, the top panel is Thor being overwhelmed by monsters. All these creatures in hell are, are after his blood and they're overwhelming him. And the second panel, you hear this oh, howling and everybody, all the monsters look up with little question marks on them because they're all going, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and the last panel is a ton of wolves coming down out of every direction to attack the monsters and save Thor. So in this case, it's three panels. I've run the sound effects at the top of each one. So you get the first effect and then you read down into the panel and see what's going on. In Thor, you know, because it'll be in color, you only see Thor's fist coming out of the pile there. Mm -hmm. And it's silhouetted so you can see it rather than having a lot of background around it or a lot of other monsters in there. I want that. But I've got a couple of monsters large in the foreground to establish depth inside the panel, even though the panel is, it's all texture. I've got stuff that those will pop out in color. Um, here, same deal. It's just all the monsters. And the question marks, just to kind of scatter it around, scatter shot, because they're all kind of going, what is that? And then finally, the wolves coming down out of the sky, actually leaping over the camera, as it were, Oops. Um, with all the monsters down below. And I don't think Thor even shows up in this one. He's still swamped by all the creatures. Um, but, and it was sort of interesting drawing wolves from underneath. That was a tricky uh, assignment, but they worked oh. out pretty well. So, that's fantastic. Um, and that's, you know, I, these, these are pages with a ton of things on them. Uh, one thing about, this is just, this is the previous, is this the previous page? Yeah. yeah. This is where Thor is, Thor is wielding his hammer, attacking some of the critters. Uh, the bad guys, he's running on the second panel and then smashing guys in the third panel. And what you'll note about that is, for example, he's bringing it over like that. So it's really a, it's a stable panel where it's this vertical blow and stuff around it. But the sound effect takes you out of the panel up into this next, the next drawing. In this drawing, again, we see the same figure, much smaller to establish some of the depth and some of the creatures around him. And the sound effect drops you down into this panel with a word balloon and then a sound effect here. He's swinging his hammer that way, which brings you back over to the other side of the page. So basically every panel, the composition and eye direction in every panel is to try and get you, again, you get the hammer moving up so you can read right down the hammer back through the sound effect, I see this. And then you get this large head and a sound effect on the end and the word balloon here, pulling you down to the bottom panel which is you know, Thor taking on the creatures. Nice. So I don't think about that stuff much anymore. Um, when I was first in comics, I thought a great deal about eye direction and designing pages and how I wanted your eye to go across the page. So that's the kind of stuff you work out. Whatever your disciplines are, whatever you're doing, you'll think about it and you'll bring that to it. And hopefully art school will have given you some of the tools to figure out that stuff, whatever it is, whatever your discipline is. Um, I know that's probably, I probably just about yeah. doing them out. And then when, once you do your absolutely best portfolio, then you'll get your break at some point. It, it may take a while. Uh, there's a Ron Friends. I should let you tell that story. Oh, this is your okay. story. All right. Okay. This is back in the olden days um, when I was an editor. I had a book called Kesar and the mm -hmm artist Brent Anderson was leaving um, to go off and you know play in another book somewhere and um, that rat Brent if you're watching this you rat it may have been <laughs> it was something I was uh, working on actually so I may have like <laughs> stolen it from my own anyway um, so I started looking around for somebody to do take over Kesar 
and uh, everybody was busy and I thought, well, I can, I'll look in the slush pile and see, you know, the unsolicited material and see if there's anything. You better tell them what slush pile is. I just oh. enlarge that one. Oh bit. yeah. Okay. A slush pile is what we used to call, I don't think they do it anymore, about uh, you know, when people send in, uh, like, you know, art, all sorts of samples, like sample portfolios. They, they, mm -hmm. they used to come in in the mail is what it used to happen back in the olden days. Essentially um, unsolicited samples. Unsolicited samples and people okay. give samples saying, look, look at my work and give me, look at my art and give me work. And um, usually there were more people who were sending things in than you had room for. But and not all the stuff was professional. No, not all of it was. But if things were promising, then we had a, a one of my friends, Al Milgram, had a, a drawer, and he would, you know, anything that was good, he would shove it in the drawer. And um, you know, if anybody actually needed an artist, you could go down and you know, go you know, look through the slush pile and see what you found. And I found an artist who was really, it looked really good, and there was no name on the pages. No name, no number, no information, nothing. Wow. There was no way of knowing who this person was or how to contact them. Our, our, our best guess was it might have had a top sheet because they were stapled together and the top sheet had the information on it gotten separated yep. and there was no, it was just gone. So I said, oh, mm -hmm. so I and went on, went down to the slush pile and found a, an artist named Ron Friends who had his name on the, the on every page. And his contact and his information. Contact information. And so I, I, and his work was good too. So I called up Ron and I said, um, I called the number. Yes. And I got his mother. <laughs> and he was a Canadian kid and had, um, was he in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. I Pittsburgh. I'm just Canadian. I'm Canadian. 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 Originally, I'm Pittsburgh. Whatever. And um, he, she said, well, yeah, he wanted to do comic books, but he's doing animation now. Um, the samples were two years old. Two years old. Two years ago, he sent these samples in. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, she said, well, do you want me to give you his number? And I said, sure. Yeah, sure. And I called him up and I said, so uh, you want to do a comic book? And he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So then he came over and did comic books. And now he's had a very nice career. Thank you very much. Doing comics. Doing comics. Okay. So, Legend. so you never know. The moral of the story is put your name on everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah, really. Definitely, because somebody the somebody may want to call you and they need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, my break was walking into the coffee room at DC mm -hmm. with a portfolio and talking to Howard and Michael and Bernie and Dan, oh. and and then having Michael hand my portfolio to Jack. Uh, I Not Jack, Jack Abel. I know Jack Adler. Jack Adler. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Jack. The Jack Adler and having Jack carry it out, like it enough to carry it out to show it to Carmine. And Carmine became one of my big fans at DC. He liked he liked my work. Um, it was very it was linear. It was very designy. Carmine's own design was very strong. Um, a quick story about that: uh, when Carmine, there was a fanzine. Are you well, people getting tired? Yeah, of you guys bored story? to death. No, no. We can stop this now. <laughs> We're done. We love these stories. You can keep going. No, keep going. Don't. Don't uh, well, don't we'll go don't feel ashamed of dogging. Yeah, you can all put your little thumbs up on the screen. Okay, we're thumbs down. That's right. So Carmine, uh, he was a pre-Kirby artist. I, I mark Jack as kind of a watershed guy. There were pre-Kirby artists and post-Kirby artists. And Carmine was wonderful, pre-Kirby for sure. But he had a he they DC for a while had a kind of a fanzine. Not really a fancy a prosing, really, but it was like the amazing world of DC Comics, something like that. It would tout new comics coming up, and it would show art samples and all sorts of stuff. And it was a magazine size; it was you know bigger than a regular comic, black and white with a two color cover, I think. And uh, there was a cover that that Carmine had done the layout for. Carmine had a lot of cover layouts for a while, cover layout, and it was a sort of an oblique shot down, like looking down at a conference table, and all these. DC characters, I think all the villains were arrayed, or, and they were all sitting there with their elbows on the table, or they're doing this, or they're kind of doing that, and they're all surrounding this conference table, and Carmine's up at the head, and he's got his cigar, and he's gesturing with his cigar, and, you know, he's kind of doing this, and uh, um, on the back of the back cover, they had printed the cover sketch, same size as the finished drawing. I don't know who did the finished drawing. Carmen made a pencil, maybe somebody else inked it. I don't remember. Maybe, maybe somebody else drew it. But Carmen had the cover sketch. It was all very rough. 
and very a lot more angular than the front cover was full of energy and i was up at a studio continuity associates which was a studio back in those days that neil adams and dick giordano had on east 48th street just off fifth avenue and it was really a hangout for all of us young guys it was not far from dc it was not far from marvel you'd go you'd turn your work in the afternoon and then you'd go over to continuity and hang out so you knew all the guys in your generation in comics you knew some of the older guys russ heath was often up there neil was a few years ahead of the rest of us and uh different artists larry hama and ralph reese mm -hmm. and uh alex J, who was a graphic designer all had space up there terry austin for a while bob wyacek so you'd go there and hang out and a lot of our guys would show up and i was up there when somebody was kind of making fun of this sketch and it's loose you know all this stuff all over the place and neil said no no look at this and he pointed out everybody's elbows or arms or whatever are on the table all the way around so the table is this really irregular shape. It's this completely white space in the middle of all this scribbly rendered angular figures. And the white space locks everything together. It's this fabulous composition where all these irregular shapes define the negative space and the negative space is the center of the drawing. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was great to hear Neil describe it. And it was completely true. So there was stuff like that, you know, you meet, you, if you get into the sun business, whatever it's going to, you're going to end up doing, mm -hmm. you go meet your compadres, you learn from them. For a while, I shared a studio, I had studio space, Upstart Associates, where it was me, well, the, the most stable arrangement was me, Jim Sherman, Howard Shaken, Frank Miller. Mm -hmm. So while I was doing Thor, Howard was doing American Flag for First Comics, and Frank was doing Daredevil. Mm -hmm. so we had some good comics. Jim was more of a, he did some comics, but did more uh, commercial work. So we had some good comics coming out of there. And it was very inspiring because you'd come in and see what they'd done. Well, the, the best example, when I first got into comics, I went up one day. You guys know Bernie Wrights and stuff? Bernie Wrightson. Yeah. Bernie, Bernie Wrightson is just, you know, about a couple of years ago now, my generation, spectacular mm -hmm. artist. He set the bar for the rest of us. He did a book called Swamp Thing. He did the original Swamp yeah. Thing with Len Wein. Mm -hmm. And I went in one day. We always used to go to the coffee shop, coffee room at DC, and we'd show our that work. That was back in the olden days when there actually was a coffee When there was a when you, yeah, the floor space wasn't so expensive. DC had a coffee room. They had five or six plastic tables, crappy chairs, and about four vending machines with the world's worst coffee, some stale candy bars, awful sandwiches, and I don't know what else. And uh, but you'd go in there and you everybody would show their work around. Something you really can't do now. Um, I mean, you do it virtually because people don't live in the same area anymore. And you, but you don't see the actual physical page. I mean, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm okay. I've seen a lot of pages. But what it meant at the time was that we walk in there when they were all showing our stuff and Bernie comes in. He's got Swamp Thing 4, I think it is. And in Swamp Thing 4, there's a full page splash of a werewolf. That's a werewolf crouching down with these werewolf legs and all this zipatone, this tone work on it. And it's just spectacular. And we all think, Maybe we could take them out and throw them in front of a subway. <laughs> we don't really think that. But we all think, oh, crap. Because we think we've done pretty good work. And you look at <laughs> this thing and you go, oh, no, we haven't. And we all have to go back home and get better. So that sort of thing was incredibly ins depressing and incredibly inspiring to have to go back and, and get better. And it was great to be able to share stuff. Again, these days, it's not that way in comics anymore. Um, there are, I mean, I made a, I, I faux pod slightly when uh, a few years back when they began it, you, I have a scanner here in the studio. So I scan my work. I send it in. Everybody does that now. Yeah. You used to have to take it to the office and they'd take it from you and photograph it and you got it back nine months later. So, uh, I would, what was I going to talk about scanning? Uh, oh, I know what happened. So they gave me the, they, they gave me a folder on the, I guess it was DC, I think, on their FTP, something fast, website. something transfer protocol, whatever that is, fast transfer protocol. You guys would know all this stuff. Yeah. And uh, in it, so first time I go there, I find my folder. They're like a million folders. Adam Kubert, all of these different guys that work for DC, Joe Kubert. I'm I, I look in one of them, 
There's all these pages he's turned in. It's awesome. I think, man, this is like the virtual room. equivalent of going into the coffee shop, a coffee store, a coffee floor, coffee room, and seeing great stuff to be inspired by. And then I discovered that was like one of the biggest taboos to go into somebody else's folder. That was really not what you were supposed to do. And I, I suppose, I don't know the answer. I suppose the reason is I could easily have gone in there and fucked up Adam's pages, pulled out the scan, screwed around with it, stuck it back in, deleted the originals or whatever. I don't know. That's the best I, or the worst I could imagine. Or, given, or I could have deleted all companies. his pages. Or, or given it to one of the other companies and showed everybody what he, what he was doing or you know whatever. anything. Yeah. I mean, I will say, until I was told, don't do that. It never occurred to me. I just thought, wow, this is like treasure. It's like a treasure store to see all this more work I'd ever be able to see in a coffee. I don't know, what, a, what a great way to uns- get people inspired to be Oh, better the man, to get no, better. That's not what it was that was not how it worked. <laughs> so, so ultimately, within, within a year or two, maybe a year, they had worked out a, an FTP site where you could access your own folder, and that's all you could access. You couldn't go anywhere else, which, is- which I which I totally understand, but it was a bummer, man. It was such good <laughs> stuff. So mm, I don't know anything else that would be useful to you at art school. Art school. What, what what do you guys want to do as far as in 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 art? Uh, does who wants to go, should I just <laughs> all your names have disappeared i would call on you individually yes. oh yeah that would be so get mean. those names back up there is there somebody yeah here? well i mean i'll start i you mean start. i'm a di- i'm a digital arts and media design major and i basically do three things i do illustration well digital illustration and traditional um graphic design and animation i'm doing these three things so what? where where would you go with that when you um get- I the honestly kind of dying. So yeah. On illustrating magazines. Animation. Yeah. Um anywhere like I love like magazines with graphic design and stuff like that. Like I love designing like advertisements, all that stuff. But I also do like doing comics as well. So um that's also an avenue. I mean any an animation, I do 2D animation. So um I mean any of any work that can make me do those three things, I'm happy. <laughs> Isn't, um, isn't Adobe getting rid of what's the program everybody uses? And Mac, the Macs are really cranky about. There's some an, simple animation program. Oh, right? animate Adobe Animate. No, Maybe. there's something that's just you go on a website. You always it downloads. It says use uh, so and so to get the animation to work. Flash, mm-hmm. flash, 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 flash animation. Yeah. Now, didn't I see something? Adobe is giving up on flash animation at the end of this year. So what mm-hmm. happens? I go somewhere and it says use flash animation, or won't they? Are going to change that out now? something uh, i actually didn't hear about that because i don't really use flash but um uh i mean you don't like it you like to use it but sometimes that's all you got mm-hmm. yeah so that's what i want to do i any of those fields i'm fine with but i love comics that's like what i've always wanted to do is just draw comics so okay. and write as well uh, i'm not a great writer though I'm, I'm, I'm getting there but not it's take takes practice um i don't know if anyone else wants to to explain uh-huh. <laughs> You can. I don't know if you can hear us. Can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm Taylor. Uh, this is Lynn. Um, I'm in more traditional art. Um, so I do mostly like large scale paintings, um, just so, like abstract things and stuff. Um, I used to do more specific things like digital art and uh, animation, but it really wasn't my speed. So I just moved to regular fine arts. That's usually how I go about uh, normally nowadays so I'm just sort of hoping to just become a fine artist just put work out there uh nothing too like big though nothing too major no comics or anything like that as of now (laughs) how large are your paintings um they're I like work I sometimes get small ones um I just recently did like a 24 by 32 um I got uh stretcher bars to make my own canvases for like a a four foot by five foot um so yeah, <laughs> so we're so we're trying to work a bigger scale to get uh to kind of fill up a gallery and stuff like that. I have a friend who who wanted to get in the comics, didn't make it, and now has paintings and galleries all over the world. Yeah, uh-huh. that's sort of how I'm I'm trying to really hope to be. Yeah, and some of those are like the one you just, they are huge. Some mm-hmm. are bigger than that. They're some of them are very large. 
And yeah. He also, I will say the one thing about Henry, he paints furiously. He just paints. <laughs> uh, he's not quite as old as I am, but he's got to be early 60s by now, maybe. So he really, uh, he still paints in a fear all the time. All the time. Yeah, he, what, he's, he's one of these guys. His, he's French, and originally. His dad is a doctor. His dad insisted he go to med school. That's right. So he finished med school, he got his doctor's degree, and then he became a painter. <laughs> he's really doctor business but he really he's a painter in real life <laughs> yep. oh okay so I guess it's yeah me. yeah um so i'm lynn i'm also in the arts program um i mostly do digital art a lot of illustration um but i recently within the last month started writing for a graphic novel idea i've had so hopefully within the the next year i'm hoping to be published oh, oh cool well Good. done <laughs> you want to make put your book in a physical form or a digital form or both uh, i i want it to be physical but i'm i'm working through it digitally uh, yeah. and i'll just get it printed yeah sure oh very cool all right, well, I got four people left on my screen. I don't know if it's you guys right. are in the same order I'm in. No. I, had this, I had this column of three ladies down my the left side of my screen. I don't know, and they have no names, but <laughs> they're all hiding quietly. But the one on the bottom, she raised her hand. So I'm yeah, good. Mo. Yeah, I you can go next. <laughs> uh, so I'm Mo. Um, I do mostly digital art, a lot of illustration. Um, and my main goal, I really want to go into illustrating children's books and oh, potentially cool. writing some of my own children's books. So that's the end goal for me. Cool. Let's talk about Jay. Whoa. Oh, just oh, our, Jay. our our ex son in law yes. has has become a uh, oh, a, a very good uh, children. I mean, he always was a wonderful painter uh, and, and an artist. And he, but he took him a while to find. He didn't go to, he he did to school for a while. <clears throat> he did comics for a while. <clears throat> then some books, other stuff. Uh, wonderful portraits, just portraiture art, portraiture artist. He did one of our comics did, for a while. Yep, and then uh, got into kids' books and took off. So John J. Muth is his name. So he's done some and fabulous he's, he's, books. Yeah, and I started writing yeah. stuff too. So that's yeah, it's really good. So it's worked so, out very I mean, well it, for him. It is possible to get a you know live very nicely as a children's book illustrator if you can. If you can get in no, there. That's the goal. I'm trying. <laughs> Portfolio girl. That's right. I just yeah. I just recently did a children's book too, <laughs> from my thing, and it's I I was it was fun. <laughs> oh, cool! All right, who's the young lady in the middle with glasses? She's in the middle for us. <laughs> That's probably me. That is you. <laughs> okay, um, so I just started getting into digital art, and so even though I'm technically a senior, I've got who knows how many years left <laughs> before I actually graduate because I just switched. Oh. I mean, so I went from energy engineering to digital art and media design. And okay. I plan on um, going into video game design and specifically working with like the scenery in video games. Good. That's, that's, I know that that is a, that is a place where you can actually get jobs and if you're- <laughs> <laughs> hey, <word. laughs> yeah, We're not, we're not quite sure what the job market is like anywhere right now. No, but we, we do know, but, we do have uh, young friends out there in, in California who actually have made it into video games. So we know it can be done. Well, one, and one of our friends actually he was a film major in college at Emerson up in Boston and he's become a vo voice director. So he, he worked for Disney for a while and then moved over into directing like video game stuff and something beyond video games, yeah. I forget what. But that's he's actually found a, a niche there for himself. He's doing really well. So and they I guess they were shut down for a while. I don't know how the animation part's being done, but the the vocal actors, voice actors have all pretty much established studios in their homes or their and with professional equipment. So they sound mm -hmm. right. And they've done uh, he was in fact he was getting home what was uh, last Friday. He had a session lined up where they were going to do something with with the actors. I think maybe through Zoom or some other program, but I think with better sound. So, uh, so that stuffs is being done now to at least some extent. I don't know how much, but it seems to be back online yeah. again. Just familiarity with the digital world is really important. All right. Well, we have one boy and one girl left to go, so you'll have to 
Uh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll let the lady go last because she seems very reluctant to say anything. <laughs> I'm going to take that guy with the blue shirt. <laughs> okay, well, I'm Matt, and I am definitely not an artist. Uh, I, can't, I can't draw for my life, but I, I, I like to think I'm a half-decent writer at the very least, and I would love to long-term eventually write Spider-Man as kind of my goal. Oh, um, yeah, that's a fun <laughs> character. I don't know how realistic that is, but man, that'd be so much fun. He literally, yeah. when we did um Fabian's interview, he literally asked like, "How can I steal Nick Spencer's job because he's working on Spider Man right now?" And I thought it was the yeah. greatest thing he ever said. You know, yeah, writing is. I don't know. Well, in the old days, anyway, writing was probably the toughest thing to get into in comics. Probably, um, right. probably partly because they need fewer writers than they need artists. Because one writer can write more than one book in a month. Yeah. Most of the artists can't do that. So, I mean, I knew writers who would write five or six books in a month. That was, that was really cooking. That was, in the, that was the old days. days. I don't know if anybody does that now. I don't think so. Um, you know, well, again, everything will depend on how well you write. Mm -hmm. uh, you write as well as Nick um, or better than that would help. As well <laughs> as might not cut it. But, but better than might work okay. Um, okay. And it's what we used to tell people about getting a job as a writer in comics is you should, you either have to get a job at one of the companies mm -hmm. doing anything, sorting the mail, returning artwork, which nobody does anymore, um, right. as an assistant editor, whatever you can get in, because then you begin to meet people and you begin the network. And that will begin, you know, you're, your first gig may not be writing Spider-Man. It might be writing Man-Thing. You just never know. He also loves Man-Thing. I love Man-Thing. That would be amazing. Oh, that might, that yeah. might work. So, so you, you just kind of work your way up. You just can't, you know, you have to do stuff like that. The other, another way to get into writing is, in comics, is to become a well-known writer outside of comics. If Stephen right. King wants to write a comic book, there's going to be no problem about having Stephen King write a comic book. Yeah, for um, sure. And there was one other thing as well. Oh, you produce your own comic that you can hand in as a portfolio. Uh, Sean McKeever. There's a lot of people who, I think, put their stories online. Yep. You know, with artwork, of course, as, you know, as stories and people in the business actually follow that stuff and read it. And if they really like it, they, you know, call you up and say, you want to write something or other. So. I mean, it's a new way of doing a portfolio. Yeah, that's, I'm not, we're not as familiar with that. Sean McKeever, who wrote for Marvel for a number of years and is now, he's off doing video game uh, scenarios uh, for some company down in Texas, I think. And he got into comics originally because he wrote his own comic and then he went online to one of the websites. I'm not, I don't know if it was DeviantArt or somewhere else and found an artist who would draw his story Okay. Not a bad artist. And he began producing his own comic very slowly. He got about three issues. It was called A Quiet Place. He got about three issues out. He got them printed and okay. distributed them at like went to conventions, sold a few copies or a few copies there. And eventually, I think, went to Marvel and to show it and connect up with Tom Brevoort. I think it was Tom. And Tom had actually seen the comic. It had made it out there enough in odd places that Tom had picked up on it. And that became Sean's portfolio. And he was able to work that in the beginning to get professional work. So okay. that's a hard road. I mean, writing stuff and finding an artist and then doing a production on it, get it squared away so you can get it into print. Now you might be able to do that going digital. You might be able to produce it digitally online, you know, produce it online, have it online. Um, There's so much. I think so many more places where people need scripts yeah. of one kind or another too. Yep. I mean, there's okay. television is just crazy. There's so much video happening right now. Right. That they they just need stories. They're like really hungry for stories. So, so you might um, be able to find something. If you're the might, next Stephen King, you want to be able to write Spider Man. Might be worth it. Look, yeah. considering that as an option if you wanted to do comics, which is bizarre to think of, to go and to, to I don't know. Netflix or HBO or something to use that as an avenue to get into comics. Once you're there, you won't go back into comics. No, no. They pay so much better. Than yeah, that. Okay, I'm done with the comics. Screw that. <laughs> Absolutely.
So. But scripts is scripts. Yep. Pretty much. One okay. left. What would you like to do? Oh, I'm going to be fast because I'm not actually an art major. <laughs> That's okay. Right. What, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm a computer science major, so I want to uh, like design software and stuff like that. And then I just do art as a hobby. Oh, so you, you may actually have a job once you get out of college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be financially supporting the club. So. Okay, well, they're happy to have you in it. So, well, that's very cool. Boy, that's, I'm, I'm in awe if anybody can do that stuff because I I, I'm so clueless. Now, now we know who to call when we get completely flummoxed. Yeah, really. Something. You're running computer problems all the time. So we'll give you a buzz. Oh, and let me tell you what. Let me just show you around my studio such as oh, it yes, is. Oh, yes, could you do that? Let me flip on the overhead light. Video tour. Down. Pop that on. Oh, let's see. Will this show actually? Yeah. Can you unplug it? Yeah, I have to unplug it. I'll do that. This is my drawing table. Mm -hmm. It's an old government drawing table from a million years ago. They were throwing it out. One of my professors at Amherst bought it. So it's about six feet by four feet. And it was being, we refurbished it. It worked great. That's where I watch baseball games over there on TV. <laughs> uh, my stereo system where i just i play music these are some of the books i've got i have a lot of books because you i have a your dinosaur oh wait 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 <laughs> let me get over here. oh, 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 oh. <laughs> i know it wasn't sorry no it's not your fault sugar. No. i just i just ran my toe into the uh um wheel i did that earlier today this is my my triceratops <laughs> nice yeah, there it, is. it was a a gift from one of my, from john Byrne, actually one of my pals john Byrne. Wow. Oh. oh my gosh. I want That's it. awesome. <laughs> the jaw is supposed to open and shut, but really it it it, it needs help. <laughs> oh, that's too cool. Like that's awesome. All right uh cd i'm an old guy so i love cds um let's see oh and i'm swinging this around like crazy i'm sure i'm giving you guys vertigo that's a p51 mustang i don't know if you can see that very well but that's nice mustang. no we can still uh, and it's in pursuit of a messerschmitt 109 over here from i used to build plastic my ear were not really built that well maybe we were snapped together but there are more books over here. Um, part of what goes on is that when I was young in comics, you had to get, you never knew what you're going to have to draw. And because of that, you got a lot of reference on things. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is, no, it's not unplugged. Uh, it shows a little better. I don't know. It just kind of blurs it out. And so I picked up a very large library, which I almost never use anymore because I go online and find the stuff I need pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, Books are all kind of organized. Oh, this is my this is my light box, which I use frequently. That's my own cover on the because I need to look at it for something I'm yeah. doing. It's iconic. <laughs> Can you guys see it? Okay, I'm not it's sure. iconic. Yeah. It's like one of my favorite covers in comics is that cover right there. Oh well, it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, there's uh, Xerox, my Xerox machine, uh, mm -hmm. which is very useful occasionally. That's my. I have a. I have an ancient Mac Pro which works fine for the studio and a large screen, which I also find very helpful. Uh, more piles of stuff. <laughs> more books. Um, these are, the books are also organized by subject. So <laughs> these books in here are anatomy and figure work, uh, lettering. These are all, this is for lettering stuff. Um, up higher is architecture. Um, sort of war stuff down below. There are animals, horses, wolves. Uh, other things of that sort, and uh, costumes as well. Part of that stuff is all costumes. Um, just closets full of art supplies, uh, envelopes, letters, whatever I need to, a bunch of ink. Oh yeah, and there's my door because my, my nephew gave me a draft at a Walter sign when he was about, I don't know, high school or a little younger maybe, ninth grade, something like that. So That's I so nice. Um, and uh, that's a that's my scanner. There's a flat file, more flat files, 
and uh, gigantic piles of books, which I have to do something with one of these years. And then that's one of my one of the covers I did years ago. I let the dog out. Okay, um, we had an assignment where uh, DC wanted to do variations on classic covers. Mm -hmm. The classic Jerry Robinson cover of the Joker coming out of a lamp, a magic lamp, with Batman and Robin being kerflummoxed, and that was the drawing I did. Nice. Um, so, you know, more books. I guess that's about it. That's and there's my printer as well, a large printer. Um, so that's pretty much. Uh, let me run you back to the table here, and Wheezy is going to let our dog out before he explodes. All right. <laughs> Which is probably a good plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who's that? Oh, that's the fan. Oh, I got with the light. Hang on just a second. Let me just kill this. So, uh, so, are you guys all squared away in questions? Um, yeah. So, right? I mean, yeah, for the, for the most part, it's good on questions. So the last week. I'll be gone in a second. No more last minute thoughts? Well, I mean, Taylor, do you want to say anything as the president of like our club, or do you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this honestly has been probably one of the most amazing talks we've ever had with somebody. Uh, you guys, oh. have been an absolute delight and absolute pleasure. Uh, it's such an honor that you guys came out and talked to us because this whole entire experience has been amazing. Uh, and thank you for answering our questions. So. Vividly and amazingly. Oh, you guys are so great at holding conversations. <laughs> um, well, so. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm glad you've enjoyed it. just coming out with this. It's honestly been a treat. Oh, I loved it so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to, I guess I'm just going to close it out. Um, again, thank you and um, and Wheezy. I just love calling her Wheezy. That's such a, that's a, that's a gangster name. It's a southern nickname for Louise. She, mm -hmm. Her mother was Louise and her grandmother was Louise. You know how it is. You got kids with the same name as your parents or grandparents. You got to find some other name for them so you can separate them out when you call them. So that's where mm -hmm. the easy. It's a southern got name it. from Georgia originally. So that's where that name came from. Got it. Well, well, yeah. So thank you so much, you and 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 Weezy, to talk to give have a chance to like get the time out of your night just to talk to us because this when Rebecca told us that you were coming on, we couldn't believe it because you two are absolute like legends. Like you guys have inspired many various other writers and artists who would become letters themselves that we look up to. And it's just, it's amazing. The secret, the secret really is we're just older than dirt. That's really the secret. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thanks for having us. It's been a real yeah, pleasure. Thanks for answering our questions. Thanks for getting to know us. Like that was even more of a treat just to yeah, like, just ask us what we wanted to do and our background and stuff. Well, I'll come find my official Facebook page and sign in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, we, and while you were talking, we kind of all followed your Instagram. So if you want to if you want to follow us back and see some of our work, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you go on I Facebook, I have going. I have more stuff on Facebook than anywhere else. I have, a, mm -hmm. I have yeah, well, I'll, I'll make a Facebook just to look at your Facebook. and that's going back. The, there are a bunch of galleries that are organized in different ways. One of them is old stuff. And the old stuff goes about 1977. I have no idea why. Going back when I was a kid, my parents saved a lot of work. So I have a tile that's about this big that I painted somewhere around fourth grade. And the elementary school I was in had a kiln, so it was fired. So it's a it's a uh, an old Civil War uh, age locomotive. I was a big train fan. So that's the oldest drawing that's on that site. It's about four. <laughs> So it's yeah, been a real but, pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yes, a great talk. It, it's no problem. If you, you guys are more than welcome to, if you have another time you want to talk to us again, you're more than welcome to, seriously. It's, yeah, it was a, it was a great talk. talk for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fine. It was a great talk. Um, for our people watching on YouTube, check out um, any of their work. Mom, um, uh, um, Waltz, Ragnarok is, I've read some of it's pretty good. Read. Wheezy's Steel Run, please. He's a great character. Support him. <laughs> good luck. All right. All right. Have, please have a good night. Be safe. Are right, you guys stay this safe? Craziness. Thank you. Yes. So All of our best. Thanks for coming by. It's no problem. Thank you so much yeah. for coming by as well. All right. Have a good one. You too.